Welcome to episode 73 of Oscar Sunday. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Izagiri. And today we finally have a Wes Anderson film for all of you wonderful listeners. <laughs> Wes Anderson's uh, 10th feature length film, uh, French Dispatch, uh, came out just a few days ago now. If you're listening to this, it's Sunday. Uh, and we will have seen it last night. <laughs> uh, we're recording Friday night. We're seeing it tomorrow, Saturday night. I'm uh, going to talk about French Dispatch for our sneak preview episode on Monday. Uh, so tomorrow, if you're listening to this now. But today, we want to honor his most decorated film, as far as the Oscars go. Uh, his most profitable film, just crushed at the box office, almost made $200 million worldwide. And uh, it's, the, it's the Grand Budapest Hotel from 2014. The film tied Best Picture winner Birdman with nine total nominations at the 87th Academy Awards. And we will definitely be getting to those later. We will also give our own awards out to the Grand Budapest Hotel. But we got to jump right into these individuals because we have tons of them. Uh, that's probably a great place to start just talking about Wes Anderson and his ability to get people on board for his vision, to get people involved. Just tons of Oscar nominated actors and actresses who have taken part in his filmography and are a part of his world. It's, it's so cool as a fan because you're not only watching an auteur at work in Wes Anderson, you're watching all these incredible performers who knock a lot of stuff out of the park, especially in his films. Yeah, his ability to create an ensemble, I think, is his strongest skill uh, right next to his impeccable uh, eye for production design. Uh, for this episode, I've, you know, for... If you listen to the show for a while, you know that I have often been caught in the I haven't seen that category when it comes to Wes Anderson. And I did not want that to happen today. So I marathoned his entire filmography over the past week. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's Bottle Rocket, Rushmore, Royal Tenenbaums, uh, Life Aquatic, Darjeeling, uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Moonrise Kingdom, Grand Budapest Hotel, Isle of Dogs, and now French Dispatch. Ten. He's at the magic magic ten number. Uh, after this is his 25th year of filmmaking, he, you know, Ball Rocket came out in 1996 and, you know, I'm really glad you're in the boat now, you know, you're in the Wes Anderson boat. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. It feels good to have tackled his movies. Uh, all of these felt like crucial pieces of a puzzle that I needed to put together. And I'm very glad I did it. But Anderson, yeah, is a, uh, um, amazingly original filmmaker you would uh, before we started uh recording you would mention how wholesome he is and uh it's true there's just this quality about him like he wants to tell like his own fairy tales and it's it's amazing i i it's this whole weird odd world full of fake countries and like p the strangest people but all with big hearts and i just i i how do you not love that yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's how I felt for a while now, you know, like just being a huge fan of his, I've spoken about him a ton on this show specifically. And even back when I was on filmgasm regularly, I would bring him up through top tens or just bring him up just to bring him up, you know, cause I, I, I really admire the guy. Uh, he, you know, is, 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 was born in Houston, Texas is, is from here. Uh, I've, I've always felt a lot of pride in artists that I grow to like and then learn that they're from Texas. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. That's I love when that happens. Same thing happened with me with, you know, Richard Linklater and like bands like the Black Angels. I'm like, wait, they're from Texas? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Let's go. We're all right then. OK, <laughs> <laughs> not the best place, but we got some we've, we've bred some uh, pretty cool individuals who have contributed a whole lot to art that I am kind of obsessed with. And Wes Anderson's like at the top of that that list. Uh, his mom's name is Texas, you know, like, fuck. Yeah. That's oh so cool. She was, a she was like a, a real estate agent 
uh, and an, and an archaeologist and his dad, uh, Melvin, I believe is his name, uh, worked as a, like an advertising and PR. And you can like, holy shit, Wes Anderson uh, grew up with a mom, like an archaeologist for a mom. And like, look at his movies. They're like, it's like a little kid architect is like always using his imagination, always kind of thinking of the wonderful and the delightful to look at the, obviously the symmetry. And you spoke about the production design, all those things just matter so much to kind of his brand and his trademarks. The, the look of them is the first thing you, you, you know, right away where, where you're at, you know, you're in the hands of Wes Anderson and uh, you know, words like quirky and <laughs> whatever. I don't, I don't really, they can, they can stay to the side. He's, he's an awesome filmmaker. And when you really break down each movie, there's just something really valuable to take away and some kind of technique or decision that he made that is like last inside of you. You're like, Holy hell, you know, whether it be uh, some of the needle drop stuff where it's like, Oh, this is like a guy who watched Scorsese movies all the time. <laughs> like that's really cool. This is a guy who watched, you know, obviously French cinema uh, during his, his formative years uh, while going to UT in Austin. Like he's just, he wears his emotions, his heart and his inspirations on his sleeve. And I, I love that about him. Uh, it's, this is, this is a long time coming. This, episode on any of his movies i'll talk about any of them but like doing budapest hotel kind of like the peak of his fame as a director and obviously award recognition it's really cool to to be here man and uh i knew this is what it was going to take for you to watch all of his movies because it's great to have a place to talk about what you like about him so we're gonna we're gonna be doing french dispatch and we're gonna do uh uh, you and i are gonna do a top five uh wes anderson so we'll kind of like save our rankings of them but like generally like what what did you fall in love with this past week with him i fell in love with the evolution uh yeah from from bottle rocket to isle of dogs you can really witness a dedicated filmmaker's growth and that is remarkable i mean you know i did the same thing with scorsese and you can kind of see it with scorsese but it's so you know gradual you don't really you can't really tell with Anderson, though, you can see exactly like where he said, all right, that didn't work that well, so I'll do this this time. And then he kept doing that every time until he kind of morphed into the symmetrical production designer, you know, perfect ensemble director he is now. Um, and also just the the very, the very uh, personal touch that's found throughout yeah. all of his films. There's definitely some inspiration through some um, event in his life that he would write down and turn into a movie. Um, like Moonrise Kingdom, he said, was about his first love. Royal Tannenbaums comes from divorce. Like, it's all in there, and he's mining it constantly. Yeah. Uh, and just, you know, I laughed my ass off. Some of the, like, these movies were so good. It's, yeah. It never feels pretentious or forced or like he's trying to impress anybody. It's just movies he wants to make. And he does it his way, and it always works. A very few directors can say that it always works, but it really does with him. Yeah, straight up, man. I, I, you know, couldn't agree more with with all of that you said. And it's so cool, as you know, you and I have been on these podcasts together for a long time now, and have have knocked out so many different movies. And like the smile you just put on my face, because like I went through that exact same thing. You know, where you're, like you're watching them all for the first time and you're like, holy shit, you know, the people are right. <laughs> this guy really is like, doesn't miss. There, there are sure, you know, there are aspects of his films and we can get into that as we talk about his nominations that, that are like, don't maybe don't um, come across as super authentic, but every movie as a whole is like at least solid and that's that's just like you said for for doing nine movies and now the tenth one being dispatch which i doubt is going to be any less than awesome yeah i i just i i think i think that's a thing that people just can't say as directors i think there are just misses in most careers and with him i think we're on the same page there really cool his first nomination was uh for screenplay best original screenplay royal tenenbaums 2001 uh you 
talked about that one a lot before we started recording. We were just kind of warming up, talking about Wes. And I will never forget the first time I watched that movie and the impact, the impact that it had is like huge, but the impact now after seeing it uh, dozens of times is like, it is almost greater. It's really crazy how this movie grows on you and gets funnier each time. And then kind of attacks your heart. Like I hard towards the end of the film. I think there are a few moments where you, you just, you kind of have to just surrender. It's really wild how he's able to do that inside of like an hour and 40 minutes, just kind of take you through each emotion with the proper amount of time, proper amount of humor, and then bang. And then the endings, his, it, I, I love, I love the endings of his movies too. I think he's so good at ending films and Ten of Bombs is just maybe, maybe his masterpiece. It's maybe uh, his best overall film where, he, it's his third one. He's right at the cusp of what be really becoming Wes Anderson. So he's kind of throwing every dagger he has uh, with, with Tenenbaums. I think you could kind of say the same thing about Rushmore, but Tenenbaums is on like a, a bit of a higher level, with, especially with the ensemble. And I mean, Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman is like a revelation in this movie. He's unbelievable. And no other movie has... Gene Hackman and no other Wes Anderson movie has Gene Hackman in. and no Gene Hackman role that he's ever done before has Wes Anderson behind it, you know, and that match was just like majestic. And seeing that for the first time, I remember just thinking, who the fuck is Gene Hackman? I need to know more. And of course now, you know, I'm a huge fan of a lot of, a lot of his performances, but this is my favorite one. I think it's even better having seen the French connection and the conversation and Superman and unforgiven and knowing who this guy is and what he's capable of and seeing this kind of, you know, him to become like a, you know, want to be grandpa who let his yeah. life pass him by and is trying to do better. But everyone he loves fucking despises him. Like, yeah, perfect. It's a great, it's a great one. I know that they had, you know, their disagreements that Hackman was difficult on set. There was some bullying involved, but cast all that aside, the, we, you know, we're here to look at the work and the work speaks for itself. The Royal Tenenbaums, an argument really can be made for it to be Wes Henderson's masterpiece. It's a, um, I'll say, and that's a solid nine out of 10 for me and a beautiful film that perfectly balances comedy and drama. Oftentimes, you know, they lean into one another too much, but this is right on the fucking line. And yeah, it's a perfect blend. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the right budget, not too big. You know, obviously Budapest spends a lot more money, but Tenenbaums is just in that sweet spot of like, you got to be practical, but you have, you have a little bit of wiggle room. And like Wes was like, say less, you know, <laughs> and just, just crushes it. That that's one where I'm like, where is he for director? You know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 2001, 2001, which we have seen as a stacked year, you know, David Lynch and Peter Jackson and Robert Altman. Those guys were all nominated for best director, but he's like, he's on, He's on a track that, you know, no one else is on. And it's, you're seeing an auteur being born right there in Royal Tenenbaums. And it's so special. I can't believe that movie's 20 years old. It's just ages like fine wine. Another, another one where uh, These Days by Nico is playing when Gwyneth Paltrow comes off the bus and you're like, what? It's something so simple. And he makes it just this magical moment, this goosebump moment. And Ah, he's he's special in that movie. What he's doing there, love it. Uh, this next one, I know you dug a lot as well. Uh, 2009, Fantastic Mr. Fox was nominated for Best Animated Feature Film of the Year. Lost to Up. Yeah, everybody loses to Pixar. You know, it happens. <laughs> you can't you can't win them all, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, I don't, he hasn't won anything yet. No, he hasn't. He hasn't. <laughs> he's been he's been nominated a, a, a handful of times, but never has won anything at the oscars he's won in my heart <laughs> yeah i i do just want to point out like i can't believe that nobody has ever been nominated for an acting oscar from his work which is sad it's fucking silly is what it is yeah. you know um, i mean yeah, yeah gene hackman jason schwartzman and rushmore uh bill murray in life aquatic it's uh how about mr ray fines in grand Budapest hotel like mm. good god <laughs> I yeah, oh, this yeah too much. I'm hoping French Dispatch breaks that streak. 
that would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, if if Dispatch could get not only maybe get him a win, but also yeah, one, also one of his performers get at least a nomination. That would be that would be lovely. Fantastic, Mr. Fox. Though I I grew up with Roald Dahl uh, with his books. I read Matilda. Oh, you did. Yeah. Oh, I bet this was a great experience for you. <laughs> Holy shit. Matilda, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the BFG, the Witches, the Twits, and Fantastic Mr. Fox. I read this book as a child. And oh, man. <laughs> How did you was, not see this yet? <laughs> I just never, I don't know. I don't know. I honestly, I have no explanation. Ugh. But I loved it. I loved Fantastic Mr. Fox. It's so delightful and funny and the animation style is incredible. I don't know what he did. It's so gorgeous. I think it's, is it stop motion? Yeah. Yeah. That's stop motion. And obviously uh, it's been, it's been labeled as like dollhouse cinema is like Wes Anderson yeah. style, especially with the, uh, the animated films, that one in yeah. Isle of dogs. That makes sense. But yeah, this was uh, this was fun. Uh, it's basically to me, it's the, it's the fourth oceans movie. Like, Mm. It's it's a heist movie starring George Clooney as you know a guy who used to steal for a living and is past his prime with a family, but wants one last score. Yeah, it's it's Danny Ocean Fox, <laughs> but Danny Ocean Fox, I love I, it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really like this. Was the one I started with for my uh, my marathon, and I was already like, I'm gonna have a lot of fun with this because <laughs> because you had already seen. Budapest and Life Aquatic. Any others? Life Aquatic. You had yeah. seen those two, 2004, 2014. Okay. So I had a lot of work to do. And thankfully, like everything but Royal Tenenbaums is streaming for free. I had to rent that one, but everything else is, is on stars, which is great. Yeah. Awesome. Super accessible filmography. Yeah. Yeah. Two of them are on fucking Disney Plus. Yeah. yeah that was great. Oh yeah, fantastic, Mr. Fox. The fun one, great one for the family, and uh, really showcases just you know Wes bringing his skills to animation and just what he's even more capable of doing with that medium is remarkable. Yeah, and that that one has uh, you know George Clooney and Meryl Streep. Like, what the fuck? Doing an animated movie? What's this guy? What's this guy got? The rest of us don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wes Anderson getting getting all the legends on board for Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah, that's a really cool movie. I kind of wish it would have beat up, but you just you're not going to take that monster down. That's a good movie. Yeah, up up's a classic. That's a that's a tough uh, competition right there. Yeah, it is. What else? What else was up that year? Uh, 2009. 2009. Um. Uh, best animated feature that year was um, Up was the winner, Coraline, Fantastic Mr. Fox, The Princess and the Frog, and The Secret of Kells. Okay. Weird group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. The, the animated category when it goes to five is sometimes like, uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and they they have to have the Disney so Princess and the Frog, which is which is fine. The movie's okay, I guess. Just they just kind of have to have it in there because because it's Disney. I saw about twenty minutes of that film while I was giving blood a, a couple of years ago, and I don't remember. I I got nothing. I haven't. Yeah, it was in the middle of the movie. I have no context. Yeah. Eh, well, maybe one day for some. Uh, maybe one day we'll do up and we can do our best animated kind of showdown and knock those out. Who knows? Uh, uh, Next up for Wes Anderson's nominations is uh, original screenplay 2012 for Moonrise Kingdom. Moonrise Kingdom. Uh, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time to, this is, this is when I said, okay, I have to know what else this guy's done. Uh, I remember it like yesterday. Uh, I was, I moved to uh, Romania and I lived there for a little under a year uh, in, in the fall of 2012, uh, in October. So really like, like nine years ago, basically. Uh, and I was 17 and Moonrise Kingdom was a movie that when I 
I came home for like a couple of weeks because I had to renew my license, which was my ID while I was living in Romania. So I had to come back for a little bit in January of 2013. And in January of 2013, uh, my brother's friend, his name is Matt Stepter. Uh, very glad to give him a shout out because he was a Wes Anderson fan way before I was. And uh, he's, he's a little bit older than me. Uh, again, my older brother, Adam, is like one of his very best friends. And they were kind of trying to do this website thing where they were talking about sports and movies. And Matt uh, wrote a review for Moonrise Kingdom. And I read it and I was like, oh, maybe I should try to watch this. And I, I watched it and I was like, huh, I don't think I've quite seen that before. You know, uh, again, 17 years old. Uh, well, at this time I was 18 when I, when, I, when I finally watched it. But when it came out, I was 17. Uh, very impressionable by, especially by movies at that time. I was, I, that was when I was discovering a lot of the filmmakers I love now. And I was, I was like on, on that run where you're watching all the Coens and the Tarantino and the Paul Thomas Anderson. And I was like, I, and Spike Lee, it, it was time to figure out Wes Anderson, you know? And Moonrise is like probably one of my bottom three Wes Anderson movies, but I like love them all. But something about it, you know, something about that tone and that attention to more movies like this. And I remember Matt being like, oh, they're better, man. Like there's more movies that are better, like that, that are completely different, you know, are completely different types of stories. But yes, they all have that tone of just, you know, being wistful and funny and dark uh, all at the same time. And that was, that was when I went on this just hunt for everything that he had done. And during that, I would say that year, 2013 is when I just became like a disciple of, of Wes Anderson. Uh, and I, you know, watched Tenenbaums and Ball Rocket. And not only did I watch them, I just bought them. I bought them just because I knew. I was like, I don't really give a shit. This guy's awesome. I'll, I'll buy whatever I have to to just watch them. And so, you know, I, I've had, that was the first Criterion uh, Collection DVD I ever got was Royal Tenenbaums. I bought it and I watched it and I was like, holy hell, what the fuck is this? And so then I went, went and watched Rushmore and Bottle Rocket. And I was completely shattered. And then I bought Life Aquatic Criterion Collection. And then I, you know, then I watched Darjeeling and then, you know, Fantastic Mr. Fox. And then, of course, I went to see Budapest in, in theaters and I was like the happiest person alive. And without that little review from my brother's friend, Matt, that I really looked up to and I still look up to now, I just think he has a tremendous amount of, of good taste for things and good taste for art. And I looked up to him big time, you know, at that age. And I was like, oh, I want to know more about whatever this guy thinks is cool, you know? And if it weren't for that, that little review that he wrote for this website that, that no longer exists, I just wouldn't be the fan I am today. Uh, I, I bet I would be a fan. I bet I would have gone back at some point within the past nine years, but not, not that heavy. You know, I went into it really heavy and I, I have to shout him out for kind of showing that move, showing me that movie without showing me, you know, I just read something that he wrote and his passion about it and his passion for Wes as a, as an artist, as a creative, I, I had to know more. And I love those pushes that people give you, uh, whether it be someone, you know, or don't know a friend, relative, whatever it is when someone pushes you to like go and check new stuff out, it opens up just massive doors and the Wes Anderson doors have been open for a long time for me. And I've kind of taken them on as my own. You know, I see them, see these movies as my, as my buddies, as if I'm ever feeling anxious or depressed, I like Wes Anderson is where I go. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for that. That attachment to Moonrise Kingdom will always kind of put the movie in a, like a special place in my heart, even though it's not my favorite of his, you know, uh, and that's what each of them, each of them, I have a story for all of them, you know, that's how, that's how much his filmography means to me and, and how much I, I, I appreciate it. And Moonrise is awesome. I totally, totally agree with the screenplay nomination. I think this and Budapest is where he's saying, I'm, I'm fucking back. I'm going to be on the track that people want me to be on. And I, I'm going to make some kick-ass movies this decade. And he did. 
he, you know, now dispatch is going to be four movies inside of nine years. And if they're, you know, that's, that's an incredible run he's had. So really, really excited. That's a, that's a, that's a great story, man. I'm glad you were able to have a push into a filmmaker. And um, yeah, I don't know if you realize, but you did that for me with Wes. I have to. <laughs> and I'm hoping I can one day do it for somebody else. It's, you know, hey, exactly. That's what pass it on. That's what being a film fan is all about. Finding things you love and telling people that you care about to check it out. And then to hoping they, you know, continue it. It's the best part. It's why, you know, I still do the, the reviews. I'm hoping somebody reads those one day and thinks, huh, maybe I'll check this out. That's it's, all it is. Yeah. That's all it's all it the is. Best. It's all hope. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Wes plays with the idea of hope quite often. And uh, that's kind of cool. Hell yeah, man. It's awesome. Moonrise, what was your, uh, first off, how about Lucas Hedges in Moonrise? That was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> I was like, damn, this is getting really Lord of the Flies uh, for a minute there when the kid got straight up stabbed in the kidney. Yeah, good <laughs> Lefty <Lord>. scissors. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was not expecting Bruce Willis to bring the pain. I thought I, I thought this was part of his, you know, I've checked out, give me a Death Wish remake and shut the fuck up, you know, phase. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's nice to see there's still filmmakers who can, you know, wake him up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> isn't that nice? I don't think you could be asleep while doing a Wes Anderson movie, right? You, you're just like, holy hell, everything is everything is so showy and so fun. Like we, we're just, we're, you're clearly making a movie when you're on, in one of his in one of his movies. You're not just there to just just kind of work and move along with the next day. You're like you're like inside of something special. My first thought when Bruce Willis showed up in Unrise Kingdom was actually like, oh, this explains why Edward Norton was at the Bruce Willis roast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's why he was there. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a delightful movie, you know, deals with young love and they were like, the two, the two kids who were in love and running away made a lot of good points. I mean, what else do they have? And yeah. like, just let these kids do their thing. They clearly know more than you do. <laughs> so um, cool. I was like, kind of panicked when the kid got straight up struck by lightning and then just got up <laughs> like that was odd but um overall is that max fisher yeah <laughs> yeah delightful movie i i liked it um yeah awesome awesome stuff yeah yeah moonrise is i think it gets a little bit better each time you watch it just a little you you notice little things that are just just absolutely wild and another 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 killer soundtrack slash score and that's just one of one of uh, Wes's trademarks. Uh, next one, uh, best screenplay, best directing, and best picture of the year. This is Grand Budapest Hotel, 2014. Uh, we're gonna talk about this one a lot here in a little bit. So, yeah, it just kicks ass. <laughs> it kicks ass. We'll, we'll move on to his last nomination, which is a uh, best animated feature film for Isle of Dogs, 2018. <clears throat> I think this is the one. This is probably his worst movie, if I had to pick one. Uh, I like it a lot. I like a lot of the stuff going on. I Brian Cranston being in, in, in this is just a dominant vocal performance. And it's got its issues, though. Uh, I love dogs. And I think it's going to age poorly. Uh, just... Yeah, just with it's it's a little bit insensitive to Japanese culture, and I just think that stuff was mishandled. Trying to pay homage and being kind of like a culture, doing kind of the cultural appropriation thing, like that's a fine line. And I think Wes teeters on it a little too much in this movie. Uh, I've I've read reviews of this movie that just tear him to pieces, and you know, kind of just cast their stones at him. And it's totally fair, totally fair. It's a an opinion that is fine with this movie, but it does not does not affect the rest of the filmography at all. Like, yeah, you know, I still adore pretty much everything else he's done. I've I've had Isle of Dogs at an eight, but the more I talk about it, the more I think about it, I think I am going to drop it to a seven. Yeah, uh, I do think it is funny that it's hilarious. It's yeah, but like the fact that Wes Anderson got flack for appropriating Japanese culture and kind of mishandling it. The fact that he got flack for that before like Quentin Tarantino ever did is kind of hilarious. 
yeah, Quentin can like fuck with black exploitation and Jackie Brown and, you know, do all these things that are kind of outside of his own culture just because yeah. he, just because he quote unquote grew up around black people, you know, like, 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 yeah, Tarantino gets away with murder sometimes and like literally and, uh, Wes Anderson got Wes Anderson got because they people don't expect that from him, I think is yeah. the main thing. They expect some authenticity and some, you know, originality and uh Isle of Dogs, there's just some stuff in there that doesn't, yeah, just doesn't look too hot. Uh just it's just been three years. So yikes. Yeah, I agree. It's I think it's a little too long. I think there's too many subplots. Um it's just too much at all at once that just didn't work very well probably because you know you've got this kind of rotten foundation of just poorly misguided japanese uh culture representation that just does more damage than it does good and when you start with that and you build from that it's everything's gonna sink yeah agreed yeah this is a a screenplay by wes and the stories by wes uh, Kunichi Nomura, uh, Jason Schwartzman, and Roman Coppola. So, <laughs> quite, quite, quite a group. And I, I think maybe they should have just let Wes write this, or you know, figure out figure out a way to kind of hone in. And like you said, there's too too much going on at once. And like, I feel like I'm able I'm able and allowed to kind of criticize him at a high level because I love his work so much. And again, like I love dogs is still at least a seven, maybe an eight for me uh, at the moment. And that's crazy. If that's your least favorite movie from a guy who has nine movies, almost 10 now. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I did say that he doesn't miss. And I do think I love dogs, a beautiful film that has a, a good story inside of it, but it is hard to ignore the very odd decision to go that direction with Japanese culture. I don't know why he did that. I don't know why nobody told him like, hey, maybe do a second draft on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like nobody said anything or if they did, he wasn't listening. And I hope that's not what happened. Yeah. 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 I, I think there are misses in this one. I think, I think there are, there is stuff in it that could be like, it could stir someone too much to where they just don't like it at all. And that's, that's totally fair. Totally fair. I can't can't judge those people for having that opinion. I just hope that it doesn't detour them from watching his other stuff. You know what I mean? Like that's the first movie you watch. I feel bad for you. Oh if yeah. I, if Isle of Dogs is your first Wes experience, which for a lot of young people it probably is. You know, a lot of people. I mean, obviously we're young, but people who are like below age twenty, yeah, chances are Isle of Dogs is the first Wes Anderson movie they probably saw in theaters or had an experience with, and that's that's unfortunate on some levels. Another issue I did have with it, and this is more with the marketing, that was not a kid's movie. Oh, not at all. But not it was very much billed as a you know young boy goes to find his dog kind of adventure comedy. But that's a pretty really dark dystopian like you know future drama about just like genocide. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Good. Good stuff. So this came out while we were both working at Alma Draft House. This came out in 2018. And uh, I, I went and saw it with uh, my lovely fiance, Brianna, and her friend, uh, our, our friend, I, I, I quite like this person, uh, Leslie, who worked there with us as well. Uh, we went and saw it. Leslie and I are both big Wes Anderson fans, and Brianna was like, oh, I'll check it out. You know, this was her first. Oh, we all really liked it in theaters. We were all like, that was great. You know, and then you think about it more and you're like, huh. <laughs> and then you see it again. And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> That happens a lot when you see a movie in theaters, you're just kind of blown away by it. Yeah. And you don't, you don't, I love watching stuff at home because I, I just take it for what the fuck it is, you know? And I, I, I I feel so comfortable like critiquing it in my own head. If I'm watching it on my couch at home, if I'm in theaters, I'm just like, Oh, Whoa, (laughs) look at that giant screen. You know, uh, uh, like, like I know when I rewatch Halloween kills, I'm going to be like, yeah, see, this is my issue with it because I can't quite put my finger on it. Right now, because in theaters, there was some crazy cool stuff going on. But I know when I watch it at home, I'm going to be like, huh, this is I think this is what this what my problem was. I love I love when that happens. Uh, And. I actually uh, back back to Draft House and and Isle of Dogs. 
when we saw that movie, there was a family about to, like, they were like in line to see it. And I told them, like, I told them the truth. I was like, because they're like five and seven, these two kids and then like a, a young couple. And I basically convinced them and they ended up getting, going to a different movie. Cause I was like, look, this is like, not, not typical, you know, children's, you know, films. And the dad was like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, it's like, it's going to be a Wes Anderson movie. You know, it's going to be, it's going to have some dark humor. It's going to be a little bit hard, harder to follow for kids. And it's going to be built on like the, the vocal work from these amazing actors that these kids are not going to like be attached to. And I was talking to him about it and he was like, huh, you know, and he's like, who is that? You know, Wes Anderson, I kind of like told him some of his movies and he's like, oh yeah, I've heard of those. Those are all kind of weird. Right. <laughs> that's what the, that's what the guy said. And I was like, yeah, like, that's what they're, they're known for being a little, little off kilter, you know, <laughs> like a little, a little strange. And he's like, okay. And I, they went to see something else. I'm not, I can't remember what it was, uh, but they basically were like, oh, we didn't know. And that's just like, you can, you can attest to this. When you're working at a the theater, people just blindly go into movies sometimes and not blindly like, oh, we watched, uh, you know, we didn't do anything. Like blindly, like we watched the trailer and we just, whatever. We don't even know what to do with our time. They don't know any of the names that are involved in it. They don't know what exactly the tone's going to be because they don't know about the filmmaker or the actors that are in it. And so they just kind of go and they're surprised when they see something that's totally different what they expected. And you're like, what? Like, <laughs> you don't even need to watch the trailer. You can, just, you can just figure a movie out by looking at its fucking IMDb page, you know? And people just don't know how to read that language. And we, I learned that very quickly while working at a theater where people just go for like mindless entertainment and you're like uh, that's not what all these movies are you know some of them some of them are really trying to speak to you and isle of dogs is really trying trying to speak to you so uh <laughs> i couldn't believe when i saw families walking into that movie it's like what are you doing go see fucking you know if you really want to bring your 12 year old that's great that's great but like five-year-olds and like little kids they're gonna see like dead dogs and shit what what the hell <laughs> Well, I mean, that's, you know, it's rated PG-13. That's a big old you yeah. know, red flag for it. Yeah. People don't fucking pay attention. They just see like a bit of a trailer. They're like, oh, our kids are like that, you know, and they just want to distract their kids. And so it's, it's a whole, whole thing. But that's how like kids movies, that's how they thrive. <laughs> that's how they always dominate no matter what is going on. You know, kids movies will always because ultimately parents are like, hey, I just want to like put this thing on for my kids. So they'll sit down and, you know, just focus on something for a fucking second, you know, and it can backfire. That's for sure. Yeah, it can. I remember back when Deadpool came out, they had to have oh, signs up that said like, Hey, parents, this is not a, you know, this is not a X-Men movie. It's not a Marvel cinematic universe movie. This is a hard R rated action comedy with a lot of blood guts and tits. So maybe don't take your five-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe. And, and nobody, you know, people still took their families. People don't read. People don't pay attention. Yeah. People always think they know best. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> it's so funny. Fucking I love dogs. I'll never forget that. That kind of run while I was at that theater and people in that area specifically are just very unaware of like what's happening in the film community. Uh, shout out to Stone Oak, San Antonio. <laughs> you guys don't know what's going on. Uh, now let's move on to the to the big movie of the day of the episode, Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, there's a lot of actors in this movie that we're going to, I want to kind of rifle through them. I don't want to spend too much time because there's so many of them and I want to get to those nine nominations and our awards later. Uh, so just to save you all listeners from being here for three and a half hours, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to breeze through these actors, even though we both uh, have a, a lot in our hearts and minds to say about almost each one of them. Uh, we'll start with uh, the star of the show, Ray Fiennes. I mean, I mean, what the fuck do you want from this guy? He's 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 fucking Voldemort. He's Gustav, one of the best Wes Anderson characters of all time. Uh, he was nominated for supporting actor in Schindler's List, nineteen ninety three. Uh, like just dominant performance, scary performance. Uh, and then best actor in a lead role, uh, English Patient, nineteen ninety six, was also nominated. So just two nominations, no wins, but this guy. Uh, one of the best alive right now, like one of the best straight up versatile actors that we have. Uh, what do you think? He is certainly not an inanimate fucking object. 
That's that's for certain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, nice in Bruges reference there. Love his performance. In oh, English. yeah. Episode 41 on Oscar Sunday. Had a blast with that one. Harry Waters. One of the <laughs> biggest cunts in movie history. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, he's he's so delightful in in this film as just a, a man so dedicated to his job that it is in, it is his entire life. He lives to please. And mm. I love that. And he I love his dedication to poetry and doing the right thing, but also, you know, banging old ladies to try to get in the will. <laughs> like, he's, he's so kind good. of a sleazeball, but his yeah. heart's in the right place most of the time. <laughs> and with this film, you really get to see how Rafe finds, um, you get to see his range of play. You know, he doesn't play a lot of heroes. He plays a lot yeah. of bad guys and a lot of kind of questionable characters. But Monsieur Gustave is, is a hero. He's, he's a good man. And I, I just, I like seeing Ray Fiennes play such a noble character. Me too. Me too, man. <laughs> it's, it's my favorite performance of his for sure that I've seen. Like you, you just spoke about the range. Uh, his, his cadence in this movie is kind of unmatched. I think he, what's great about him is this is the only Wes Anderson movie that he's been in. And he, it's a, it's a sign of a, just an incredible actor to jump into an auteur's world and just fit right in, like, without question. And maybe be the best singular performance from anybody in any of his movies. He's got to be nominated for Best Actor. I just don't understand it. It makes no sense. For Budapest to get nine nominations, my first pick would be Wes Anderson for Director and then Ray Fiennes for Best Actor in a Lead Role. Like, those yeah. are the... Those are the two things that stand out the most in this movie. Uh, and then, of course, you know, costume design, production design, all that stuff is, is fantastic. Great editing as well. But the star of the show is, is Gustav and the cadence, again, that he's working on, working with uh, Ray Fiennes is like a dream. And you kind of watch movies for that kind of stuff. You, you, you watch hundreds and thousands of movies to just find that, find that kind of stuff within a movie. Uh, you're always looking for good writing. You're always looking for cool direction, cool cinematography, and of course performances. You know, I think I think every every person who falls in love with film at some point, kind of the beginning of that is is someone who wows you uh, from a performance standpoint. The stars, you know, the stars of the film, and he's just putting in an all star, hall of fame type performance that to me is one of the best from the last decade from the 2010s. And it's a damn shame. He didn't get a nomination here. It just really sucks. Yeah. I you know. I think Bradley Cooper is a great actor, but he should not be in there for American sniper, kick his ass out, put in Ray fines. He belongs there. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's definitely the top pick. Uh, it's just, yeah, that movie's talk about aged poorly. Uh, American snipers just yikes. And, one of those Clint Eastwood movies that I just can't really stand. Uh, and I have no intention of rewatching. I also love Bradley Cooper and I, I like Clint Eastwood. Fuck. He's awesome. And uh, he's a great director most of the time. Uh, and, and Bradley Cooper's usually really fucking good in the movies he's in and makes really interesting decisions, but that, that was not a good one. Uh, just not for me. Great, great call. Uh, Gustav in Cooper out. Uh, F Murray Abraham. Come on. This guy is playing the uh, older version of Zero, and he's the one who's kind of telling uh, the author, uh, Jude Law, the story of, you know, Gustav and what happened in, in 1932. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> uh, incredible. F. Murray Abraham is, is a total heat check performer in most of the stuff he's in, uh, you know, nowadays. But there was a time, there was a time when he gave one of the best uh, lead performances to win uh, at the Oscars, and that's that's his performance in Amadeus, 1984. One nomination, one win. That's all you need from Murray Abraham. Oh, Salieri. What a yeah. two-faced, duplicitous son of a bitch, if you believe that story. Uh, mm. There's a lot of myth surrounding the death of Mozart, but uh, Amadeus is such a rich, compelling, beautiful movie. Uh yeah. I would love to. I can't wait. It's a it's a winner, so it's gonna happen on this show at some point. Oh, it'll it'll be happening sometime sometime in 2022. It will be happening. Yeah. Ah, neat. I, um, it's just it's just perfect. It's one of the best best picture winners. 
I, in my opinion, the best from the eighties, the eighties is kind of a weird decade for best picture yeah. winners. And there's a lot of like, Oh, you know, let's just not give it to raging bull in 1980. Instead we'll give it to ordinary people. Like, okay, boring, you know, boring pick. <laughs> and they, they, they did that a lot in the eighties, but Amadeus is like, fuck. Yeah. Like that, that stands with no country that stands with French connection stands with Lord of the Rings. You know, it's just, Oof. it's so good. Amadeus is so good. <laughs> it's high praise. And it'll be nice to just kind of dig into Milos uh, yeah. for a while. That'll be fun. Oh, I can't wait. One flew of the cuckoo's nest we could yeah. do one day. So yeah, he's got, he's got two um, masterpieces that won. Pretty cool. Uh, but Abraham, yeah, he's, I just want to take a moment to appreciate the insanely layered framing device of this movie. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good point. We're, we're watching a, a little, a, a young girl read a book about the Grand Budapest Hotel, which turns into the introduction by Tom Wilkinson as the older version of Jude Law, who went to the hotel in its later years to be recounted the story of Monsieur Gustav by Older Zero. I mean, this is like inception level crazy detail and not once does it get confusing. And, and doesn't take two and a half hours to explain. <laughs> yeah. It takes like two minutes and you're like, oh, cool. This is fun. This is a tight <laughs> hour 40. And yeah. uh, it's great. But yeah, I, I do think um, Abraham, is, uh, I believe him as an older zero, you know, the bit where he, you know, starts crying about Agatha, y- mm. you feel it. And because he's a very talented actor who is underrated. And then after, you know, Amadeus kind of disappeared in the mainstream, like films for a while and has kind of just been sticking to the indie scene ever since. Yeah. Yeah, definitely like a character actor's character actor type guy now that like people respect, but he's not on the, you know, he's not in the spotlight too often. And I, I, I wish he, you know, he's, he's really old now. He's like 80, 80 something. Roughly, so, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> I think he was born, I think he was born in 1940. So yeah, he's, he's like a little over 80 and that's just, yeah, he's, he's been, he's been around for a long time. In my childhood, F. Murray Abraham played Noah in Muppets from Space in Gonzo's dream sequence where Noah wouldn't let him on the boat because he couldn't explain what he was. Perfect. <laughs> it's like after I watched Amadeus, I watched Muppets from Space again. I'm like, why is what? No, he's he's too good to be here. What that can't be him. <laughs> That's so perfect. I didn't appreciate the full scope and like you know, love of the Muppets. Everybody pops up in the fucking Muppets. Yeah, they all want a piece of the Muppets. Yeah, just like Wes Anderson's movies. They're like, hey, I want to, I want to be in a Muppets movie. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if Adrian Brody's been in a Muppets movie, but mm, no. there's there's still there's still time. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Adrian Brody, uh, also a one time nominated, one time winner kind of guy, like F. F. Murray Abraham. That's 2002. Roman Polanski's The Pianist, Adrian Brody, uh, pretty, pretty powerful stuff in, in that film. Uh, does kind of a whole physique transformation thing and, uh, you know, is obviously playing a very torn character inside of a very torn environment. And it's not a movie I would just throw on. Uh, you know, you, you gotta be kind of ready to watch that one, kind of have to have your eyes peeled back, ready to go. Uh, it's it's a bumpy, bumpy ride. And I'm I'm okay with him winning that Oscar. I do wish his career had gone differently since then, that's for sure. That's his own fault. He's he's an odd duck. Um yeah. But yeah, the pianist is a powerful film. Uh, you know, regardless of your thoughts on Polanski and his crimes. Uh the film is impeccable and he he has found his groove with Wes Anderson. Everything he's done with Anderson has been gold. Uh, and Dimitri is such a bastard, but a perfect bastard for this story. Yeah. 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 Dare I say that his best stuff is like uh, in Wes Anderson movies as like weird art dealers or playing Salvador Dali and uh fucking uh woody allen's midnight in paris 2011 who would have thought <laughs> rhinoceros yeah <laughs> I, that's a good movie <laughs> yeah i quite like that movie i would love to do it on this one day but there's just so much woody allen oh uh, i don't mean there's no way i would do what i did with wes anderson with yeah woody allen. i'm not straight i can do 20 years i can't do 
you know, yeah. one film a year since 1977. That's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm in the same boat as you. I haven't seen, I've only seen a handful of Woody Allen's work and I'm not really jazzed about getting to all of it either. So yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. But Adrian Brody, pretty good as Dolly. Uh, how about Willem Dafoe? Oh, yeah. Willem Dafoe. Uh, has, has he missed this decade uh, in the 2010s? Did he ever miss? Did he ever like fuck up? Dude, the, the guy has, I mean, his, the projects he's picked unreal, all like just great characters. He's been playing just fantastic characters for so long now. Um, and Jopling is such a weird mercenary. Uh, it's yeah, the stuff with him, him and between him and Goldblum are just is awesome. It's like its own short film in the middle of this movie. Uh, I love Defoe. I always love Defoe. Yeah, yeah. I think he might be my favorite, like personal actor who's in this movie in in Budapest. I. I can't, I can't believe what he's put together the past decade. Like you said, he's been, he's been kind of at it forever, but the resurgence he had, and now he's choosing movies that just movies that kick ass. And he's like always the best part. The lighthouse Eggers Eggers film from 2019. What on earth, you know, that, that performance is just out of this world. Uh, wasn't nominated for that one, but he was nominated for at, at Eternity's Gate in 2018. Uh, best actor in a lead role. Uh, best actor in a supporting role, The Florida Project, 2017. Uh, and then in 2000, Shadow of the Vampire, he was nominated for best actor in a supporting role. And then his very first one came from the hit, you know, big time best picture winner, Platoon, 1986. He was nominated for best actor in a supporting role. I like Platoon. I don't, I don't love it. I, I definitely need to rewatch it. He's amazing in it. Just like I said, he's, he's amazing in anything. I haven't seen Shadow of the Vampire, but uh, the 2017 and 2018 uh, Florida Project at, at Eternity's Gate is is out of this world, and those those both deserve to be where they're at. Uh, and he, if you put him in a group of five actors, he like to me always contends to be the winner of those five. He's just fantastic. Of his nominated work, I have seen At Eternity's Gate and Shadow of the Vampire. I have not seen Florida Project or Platoon. Yeah, um, I can't believe you haven't seen Platoon. I know. I know. blows my mind. <laughs> I, it's, I own it too. I bought it. Yeah. Uh, I just, yeah, I'm going to have to, but I, at this point I'm, you know, I'm torn between, should I watch it and get it out of the way? Or should I wait till we have it on the show so I can share my first reaction? Like, I like that too. And it's not like the thing about when people, and I kind of hate the way I just reacted, but platoon is just, it's, it's just up your alley. I just know, I know. it is. It's, I, it's eighties. It's war. It's fucking got really cool performances. I don't, I don't like taking it from strangers, but I have no problem taking it from you. Yeah. Yeah. When someone is like, <laughs> what you haven't seen that, you know, and you're like, fuck off. You know, I'm watching a lot of stuff. <laughs> like, it's not like you and I ever have a lack of things we want to see, you know, uh, just, dur- just during this past week, I was like, I really want to watch the Stephen Frears 1984 movie, The Hit, with Terrence Stamp. Like, you know, I just, and John Hurt. I just want, and, and fucking Tim Roth. Yeah, I just want to fucking watch it. You know, I don't want to, and it was great. I had a blast. Uh, it wasn't for anything. It was just for me. It was just, just simply so I could see it. I've been really into the 80s lately, trying to watch different kinds of movies from the 80s. Because I think, it get, I think it gets stereotyped a lot. I think that decade gets kind of a lot of flack for being this kind of poppy showy. Like, no, there's some gritty, really good stuff in the 80s. Really good stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm starting to enjoy it more as a whole decade. And then I, and then I watched uh, uh, Amores uh, Peros from 2000, uh, which is, uh, in English, is Love is a Bitch. <laughs> uh, and that, that's, that's a, like, spectacular, spectacular movie that, again, I just, I just did for me. I just did in my own time. Yes, I could have watched... Uh, a best picture winner or some movie that has all this huge, you know, stuff around it. I wanted to watch those movies. That's what I wanted. That's what I had in my list. That's what I was ready to watch. That's what I knocked out this past week in my own time. And I know you're the exact same way. And so it is kind of like, it's kind of like, yeah, I'll wait for the podcast to bring this up. There are horror movies that I've waited to watch because I know at some point it's going to be on film gas and I'll either be on that episode or I'll listen to that episode and like be a part of the conversation. That, that's kind of how I do things now for sure. Uh, yeah. 
because because again there's so much history there's so much in the pile in the pile of movies there's so much to get to that you and i are never people who are like this is the only thing on my mind this is what i have to watch it's like no i got like a million like a million a million movies rattling in my brain that eventually i want to get to well as of now you know i'm i'm on three podcasts a week so i've got at minimum three movies it's never fucking three movies it's always way more than three movies but i don't care i like that so there's that plus i'm in grad school for history which is a bitch i love it but it's a bitch uh (laughs) so very rarely do i have some some me time when it comes to movies but i you know before we did the wes anderson thing i did have a little window and i decided to watch deep blue sea from 1999 uh because i wanted Uh. to see sam jackson get ripped apart by a giant fake cgi shark is that too much that to ask? <laughs> i love that movie god it's so entertaining it's, it's one so of most... bad but it's so fun yeah yeah it is horrible but so good it, it's it's one of those like films i have a hard time rating because i'm like i love it <laughs> yeah. i know it i know it's not good but I, I i have a blast re-watching that movie but this is you know certain movies I know are going to come up on this show. Like I I buy best picture winners on purpose so I have them when we are eventually going to get to them. Yeah. So I hold off on those for until they come up on the show and then I can fully embrace my first reactions and bring them to the show. That's I love that. Yeah. That's the way to do it, I think. Uh It's it's, it's the only way. It's the So only in way. a way, it's kind of your fault I haven't seen Platoon. Yeah, yeah, I haven't scheduled it. What the fuck? <laughs> uh, it'll it'll happen. Uh, I guess actually this year, twenty twenty one, would have been the thirty fifth anniversary. So, Oof. Eh. we'll wait for the fortieth. Maybe we should have done that <laughs> instead of Chariots of Fire. <laughs> yeah, but you know, and now it's gone. Now, now that one's gone, and we have to we get to look forward to look forward to Platoon one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fantastic. Uh, here we go, Jeff Goldblum. Uh, wow, what a guy! Yeah, that face is exactly the face I made when I was like, "Wait, what? He has an Oscar nomination? That's right for best short film, live action, 1996." Little surprises, and what better way to have an excuse than to talk about Jeff Goldblum, who should have been up in 1986 for The Fly? Mm. What the fuck was going on there? Uh, dare I say uh, a supporting nod for his role in Jurassic Park? really hmm, maybe, maybe maybe i don't know i would have to look at the category probably not <laughs> i agree with you with the fly though that his performance in that movie is maybe like arguably the greatest creature feature performance of all time. Just seth brundle oh what a creep but um yeah i'm so i didn't know he was up for short film that's great i, I love that goldblum just, of course he would be I, I mean i feel like we only know like you know a a portion of the man, the myth, the legend of who he really is. This dude could be, you know, a 300 year old immortal vampire and no one would be surprised. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. Jeff Goldblum. uh, That's one of the, maybe the only time he'll ever get brought up on this. You never know. You never know. Uh, (laughs) uh, This guy's been brought up a few times. Harvey Keitel. Mm. Uh, He was nominated just one time in 1991. Uh, for Bugsy, best actor in a supporting role. That movie, uh, I think we kind of had mixed uh, appreciation for. I, I wasn't a huge, huge fan. I, I know you enjoyed that one a lot. You know, I'm, I'm definitely more partial to uh, the, the film The Year After for Kaitel, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, if I were to give him a nomination, that's the one. I think Mr. White is one of Tarantino's best characters of all time. And Kaitel is one of the reasons I think Tarantino's uh, initial run worked so well, because I think he was totally on board and totally understood what he was going for in both Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. Uh, I I love that guy. Uh, He, what he's doing in Grand Budapest Hotel is bonkers for him to be even in a a Anderson movie is surprising. A guy like Kaitel, this is the guy from taxi driver from 76. What's going on here? And he's coming, come, he's coming all the way back to play this weird prisoner uh, in an Anderson, a Wes Anderson film. Really, really cool. I, I love when guys commit to these supporting smaller roles in these Wes Anderson movies 
and they shine just as bright as anybody. And Keitel is great in Budapest. Uh, yeah, he is. Bugsy, I liked it because I'm a you know I'm a sucker for gangster films and biopics, and he was playing Mickey Cohen, and I was like, this is neat. Yeah, but uh, I didn't perfect. think it was. A, I think it was a masterpiece, but I did think it was it was pretty good. Uh, for me, Kaitel should have been nominated Best Supporting Actor for The Last Temptation of Christ. Ooh, I like that. Because there's nothing like watching a New York-accented Judas Iscariot screaming at Jesus Christ to get his shit together. I mean, that is just <laughs> magic. Come on, Jesus, what are you doing out there? Like, it's just, it's beautiful. But um, yeah, I, I think it's cool that he's kind of been... He, like, he clearly likes working with directors with a vision. You know, Scorsese, Tarantino, Anderson. Like, these are guys he keeps coming back to. Uh, and he does his best work with these guys. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, Reservoir Dogs, for sure, should have netted him a nomination. He's lights out in that movie. Yeah, they missed on that one. You know, that happens a lot with the uh, the debut, the film debut for a lot of folks. You know, it's like, oh, let's wait. Let's wait a little bit. And sometimes they miss the best stuff. You know, they... You you want to give them nominations. You know, I think like Michael Mann is my favorite example of that. Like thief is it, that's his best movie. So just fucking give him the, give him the, give him the flowers for this. And then we'll see what happens after. But when you, but, but when you wait until the last Mohicans, you know, it's like, oh, no, you missed it already. <laughs> you fucking missed the best one. And I think Reservoir Dogs is, is awesome and fantastic. And one of the best debuts of all time. And I also think Bottle Rock and Rushmore for Wes Anderson are, that's one of the best one twos I can think of where you're like, okay, we see where this is going. This is going to be fun. You know, this is going to be a fun career. <laughs> I, li- I like what we're about to see. And that's, I wish that were awarded more often the early stuff and they wait forever. Another guy that waited on forever was Scorsese. It's like, dude, give him his flowers, please. <laughs> you're, you've waited 30 fucking years to do this. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. More on, you know, if you want to hear us really dig into Scorsese, check out our nearly three hour taxi driver episode from about a month back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, yeah. We did top five Scorsese, which took like a fucking hour. And then we talked about taxi driver, which took like two hours <laughs> and I had a blast. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Uh, but yeah, I, I do wish that, you know, the Academy was a little bit more uh, trusting in first time directors, give them a little bit more of a push instead of saying like, you got to, you know, put in, you know, put in the hours and then, you know, you get your free lunch, but until then keep at it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't like that attitude. Yeah. I don't like that attitude. I don't like, we'll keep going and getting the coffee for us for free and we'll, yeah. we'll figure out a spot for you later. Like what if it's too late? <laughs> but then you look at like Sam Mendez who won best director right out the gate with American beauty. So right. like, what Maybe his best movie. Yeah. 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 It's weird. It's weird how that happens, but that's all right. Uh, I think uh, another guy, Jude Law, uh, has been nominated twice, but way back, way back, like 20 years ago, which is crazy considering how just impressive he's, he's been for the past 20 years. Uh, talented Mr. Ripley. He was nominated in uh, 1999. He was nominated for best actor in a supporting role. And then Cold Mountain 2003, he was nominated for best actor in a lead role. I really like Talented Mr. Ripley. Not a big fan of Cold Mountain. But I'm cool with Jude Law kind of being recognized for anything. Love that guy. I think he's like thoroughly underrated. He's a great actor. Um, Have you ever seen the movie Dom Hemingway? In Dom Hemingway. (laughs) Hell yeah. I love that movie. Oh my (laughs) God. The movie's bloody entertaining. Like wildly entertaining. It's like... We got to do that movie on Filmgasm because that is just a fun ass movie. Oh my god, Jude Law is off his rocker in that one. Fuck yeah, man! Yeah, I love that movie to death. I love it opens with like just a fucking soliloquy about its cock and how awesome it is. (laughs) Just who else could do this? The fucking chops, the like dead eyed stare. That oh, not enough laurels. That movie is so underrated. Yeah, Uh, I agree. It's just kind of like his career, man. Yeah. Jude Law has just been, you know, picking and choosing some great roles over the years. I mean, he's one of the best parts of AI. Um, I love his Watson in Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he's he's a great actor. Uh, and in this, he's you know, he's he's a good. I feel like he's here because he wanted to work with Anderson. 
It's yeah. it's such a like not a, I don't want to say insignificant role, but it's not all that meaty. But he's kind of the the catalyst. Yeah, he's like a prompt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And it works. He's he's good. I yeah. He's one of those guys where I'm like, oh, Jude Law's in this. I'll see it. Yeah, I feel that same way. It's uh, it's almost like icing on the cake with uh, when you add people like him in the ensemble. You're like, oh, cool. So even when the movie's like, at, at, like you said, a, a more insignificant character, I'm still looking at a superstar like Jude Law, you yeah. know, and, and like Tilda Swinton. What the fuck? Like she's just playing a dead lady, <laughs> and she's Tilda fucking Swinton. <laughs> it's it's crazy so uh yeah i i love i love when that happens with wes's movies it's like every where you turn you're like oh oh superstar 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 and they're all just like yeah we're on here for like two seconds it's cool uh bill murray ah ah wes anderson's faithful bill murray (laughs) he's in damn near every film of his and is sometimes the best part of the film uh like of course life aquatic he he is steve zisu he is like the main the main plot main plot line main character uh he's incredible as bloom and uh rushmore he just makes me laugh so hard in that movie when he blocks that kid who's playing basketball why does he do that (laughs) what the fuck what the fuck's wrong with you (laughs) fucking dick or when he jumps into the pool while smoking and drinking like a glass of whiskey or when he puts in like nine cigarettes at once, you know, in, in the elevator and he has a Diet Coke can in his jacket pocket and he's pouring whiskey into it. Like Bill Murray is just the, he's the guy who understands every little thing Wes Anderson's trying to say, and he'll do anything he says. He'll, he will do, he's on board with the script, with the, the vision, everything. And I, I love that guy so much. Uh, Really wish he would have been up for Life Aquatic. That would have been really cool for his career. But a year before that, he was nominated for uh, Lost in Translation 2003, Best Actor in a Lead Role. So he does have a nomination. We do get to bring him up here. But uh, his significance in the filmography of Wes Anderson is pretty astonishing. He's kind of outside of Wes Anderson himself. He's kind of the first thing you think about. I adore Bill Murray. Uh, and one of my favorite things about doing this Wes Anderson marathon was getting to see so many of his performances that I had not seen yet. Uh, mm-hmm. I think he should have been up supporting actor for Rushmore. That was my favorite of Bill Murray's performances. Uh, he's yeah. I love his dedication to Anderson's craft. He's the go-to guy since Rushmore. He has been in every single film and now, even if it's just a little b- brief, you know, missing a train in the Darjeeling Limited, it it's still something. He he wants to be there. He wants to be a part of this of every piece of Anderson's filmography. Mm. Uh, even in this, he's just you know one of the members of the the Crossed Keys Society who just kind of helps him helps Gustav out one time. It's it's God. Awesome. Yeah, special stuff, special stuff. Bill Murray, uh, he's kind of <clears throat> the face. I would say he's the face of the filmography because Wes Anderson's not someone like Tarantino who puts himself in or writes characters for himself. He just he just kind of stays behind the camera. And so with that, I think like Bill, like Bill has become the face of what we think about when we think about Wes Anderson movies. Really cool, really cool. Love that guy. Uh, lots of translation. Great, great performance. Not, not like my favorite movie or anything, but he's pretty spectacular in it. Uh, next guy has an argument for being with Willem Dafoe has an argument for being my favorite performer inside the movie. And that's, that's Edward Norton. Uh, good God. I mean, fucking warm, warm from rounders. That's uh, always what I'll think of when I think about him. Uh, he was nominated for uh, best actor in a supporting role, 1996 primal fear. And then he was nominated for a very daunting, scary role uh, in American History X, 1998, Best Actor in a Lead Role. And then a just dominant, triumphant type performance in uh, Birdman uh, for Best Actor in a Supporting Role, 2014. That's a pretty cool resume, but it's obviously missing his biggest role ever, which is uh, Fight Club. 
you know, being being the main character along with Brad Pitt and this just cultural phenomenon type movie. And he's not only the kind of the face of it with Brad Pitt, he's fucking good in it. Very, very good. And I, I'll I you know, rounders. I mentioned it just a second ago. It's just those are the two movies that I think of when I think about uh, Edward Norton. And then his uh, directorial debut, Motherless Brooklyn, which I thought was underrated and didn't get enough enough love when it came out. I thought it was a really, really strong film and an incredible performance from him inside that movie. So I, uh, I Willem Dafoe as well is amazing in that movie. I just uh, love this guy. Love this guy's kind of attitude. I love his ability, like these other actors, to be in these Wes Anderson movies and not have the most to say. Uh, usually he's like an authoritative figure and it's really funny because you know like he's got some lines in Budapest that I'll uh, I don't want to step on any toes so I'll save that for later when we're giving out our awards he has a few lines in this movie that are spectacular and uh, I I truly love that guy I've kind of grown with him after seeing Fight Club at a young age and you just like who the fuck is this guy you know because everybody wants to know about Brad Pitt he's you know look at him he's the man he's the most gorgeous dude alive at that time but Edward Norton is like, wait, a minute, I want to know about that guy. The guy is kind of in the back of the room with his arms crossed. I want to know about that guy. <laughs> and and it, it, safe to say, I've, I've learned a lot about him and uh, I've been very pleased with what I've seen. Yeah, Norton's a hell of a dedicated actor, a bit of a difficult, you know, uh, reputation. But, you know, yeah. that comes that comes with being a little bit choosy about the roles you take. Um, I'm glad that uh I find I did watch Rounders. It's a fucking awesome movie. Um, I got to see Primal Fear. I have not yet seen that. Yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, and then American History X is a one and done kind of movie. That's a brutal, horrific film that I just don't want to sit through again. But it was really good. Um, uh, yeah, Norton's good, and I, I like that he he's kind of accepted his you know his role as one of Anderson's ensemble, as in like you know. You, you go over here, you say your lines and you get to be part of something special. I think he recognizes that. Yeah. It's like a total team effort. Yeah. It's really yeah. cool. <laughs> uh, here's another, here's another perform. That's just, just incredible. And is uh, probably going to rack up a shit ton of nominations by the time she's done. Saoirse Ronan. Oof. Boy, oh boy. This girl is a superstar. And the first time I saw her was in uh was in Budapest. That was the first time it really was like, who is that? She's awesome. <laughs> you know, she's an atonement way before, uh, but as a, you know, kind of adult actress, you know, she was 20 when Budapest came out. Uh, she's just like a year older than you and I, uh, born in April of 1994. I just, I, I've, I felt like this connection to her, like people like her and Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya and Lucas Hedges where I'm, I, I'm just fucking rooting for them. Like, I want, I want, I want my generation, the people that are around my age, to be remembered and you know to really have a lasting imprint. And I think she might be at the top of that list of just already been in so many amazing movies, already has four acting nominations. She's just, she just lights out. Uh, Atonement, two thousand seven, Best Actress in a Supporting Role. Uh, Brooklyn, two thousand fifteen, holy shit, kind of, kind of performance. Uh, Lady Bird, two thousand seventeen. Best Actress in a Lead Role, and then Little Women, uh, Best Actress in a Lead Role, 2019. So the back-to-back, -back, Greta Gerwig, uh, Lady Bird, L L Little Women, and then Brooklyn, which I think is her best. Just That's a lights-out kind of performance, and then Atonement. So pretty cool resume. Saoirse Ronan is one of my favorite actresses working today uh, because, yeah. like you said, you, know, you can kind of you can see a bright, bright future of just so many great films and great performances. Like she's, she's somebody who's going to be acting like well into their nineties. Like this is, we're going to see her for a long, long time. Yeah. And um, I've, of her nominated movies, I've seen everything but atonement, um, which I've heard is a, 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 a tearjerker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To say the least. Yeah. I saw that one when I was a little too young to like really understand. So yeah, it's definitely due for a rewatch. I had no idea I was watching Saoirse Ronan. So I would love to go like, go back one day and watch that. But then she also like voices characters on Robot Chicken, which is funny as shit. Like she's yeah. 
she doesn't take herself seriously like at all, but she takes her craft seriously, which I love. Any, I yeah. love that balance. Anybody who has that balance is a winner in my book. Yeah, I agree. Especially when you're just like a beautiful actress who can kind of do it all already. Uh, she She's going to rack up. She has four and she's 27. She's going to rack up so many of these motherfuckers. Like we're going to be talking about her on this show forever. She's, she's fantastic. I would love to do a Brooklyn episode. That movie is just astonishing. And she is the reason why, uh, God damn. She's awesome. Uh, so is Tilda Swinton. Uh, that's a, she's a, she's a one-time nominated one-time winner, uh, for the, for the Oscars. And that was a uh, best actress in a supporting role. Michael Clayton, the, one of the most underrated movies that I can think of where I think it gets lost, especially in kind of an Oscar conversation because no country for old men and there will be blood are so bloody fucking good and kind of went head to head. You know, it was, it was kind of a race between them two for best picture. I think Michael Clayton gets lost in that mix, but it, it has an argument. It has an argument to say, Hey, we're knocking out the door. This movie's really goddamn good. And Tilda Swinton is, fucking lights out of that movie i i there's not a lot of movies uh that i watched uh as a teenager where i was because i was you know just a fucking teenage boy i wasn't paying enough attention to female performances in movies and i wasn't seeking those out enough and i remember just being kind of like what am i doing you know that was one of those moments where i saw her in that movie and it was like oh all right all right i like i need i need to kind of unlearn what I've learned as a male movie watcher and, you know, growing up with movies like Pulp Fiction and Fight Club that are just male dominant. They're like, ah, you know, they're just, they're just, that's, that's what you watch as a, as a dude. I, I just had to kind of unlearn, Hey, like you got to seek out female performers more often until the Swinton's kind of one of the first names I think of her role in a bigger splash from 2015. Fucking crazy. Uh, her and Ray Fiennes together in that movie is an absolute treat. Uh, I highly suggest that one. That's probably my favorite, uh, like lead role of hers. Uh, fucking Bong Joon Ho's and Snowpiercer. Heavens Almighty, she's crazy good in that movie. Right, she she rocks it. Everything she's in, she just kills it. I agree. Um, in terms of like you know, as a guy, kind of realizing that you know you should be seeking out female pers- like performances as well. I I never. I never had that awakening to me. Like I was kind of always doing that because I had, as a kid, one of my all time favorite movies on tape was uh, Robert Zemeckis's 1992 underrated classic death becomes her. There you go. Which yeah. Stars Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn as two incredibly hateful women who um, find a way to live forever. And that movie kind of showed me just like, these are all, you know, with them and Bruce Willis, like these are the performances I should be seeking out just good ones. And so I'm, I'm glad I had that, but I get that, you know, a lot of people have to have that moment of like, Oh, there's a whole nother world. I'm not looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not so much that women aren't in those movies at all. Like Helena Bon Carter and fight club is just destroying, but you're kind of shaped to be in more wonder about the male characters. And you're like, it just, is something that just has to be broken down, you know, uh, yeah. always. And even something as simple as them waiting to give, you know, something like best actor out after best actress, like, Oh, like this is going to be later in the show because later in the show is more important. <laughs> Those little things as a kid, like can really affect you and like shape the way you think. And uh, obviously now I think way differently and, yeah. You know, if you listen to us on Mulholland Drive last week, <laughs> you know, you know, my adoration for performances like uh, Naomi Watts in that movie as Betty and Diane. I just uh, Tilda Swinton's one of those ladies who's like she brings the noise no matter what, even if she doesn't even fucking say a word, <laughs> even if she's in a casket <laughs> like she's just she's Tilda. She's incredible. And I do want to shout out one of my favorite roles of hers is in Okja. Which, Okja and Suspiria were the ones I didn't mention that are both amazing. 
Yeah. Suspiria, especially because I went into that thing with such low expectations because I'm a big fan of the original. Same, and I was yeah. I was floored. I was like, this is surprisingly really good. But uh, yeah, she's she's got this look about her that's just like ethereal. You know, she looks like like an alien learned how to act. Yeah. And it, I, she's such a her. She's so good at it. She's incredibly transformative and she fits so perfectly into Wes Anderson's ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. I think she fits into kind of the Wes Anderson cinematic universe and then the Marvel cinematic universe, like flawlessly. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a goddamn gift that she has Uh, her co-star. One of her co-stars, Michael Clayton, Tom fucking Wilkinson. Mm. Now this is our, this is one of our Oscar Sunday, you know, beginning stages. You know, this is one of our guys. Uh, Anytime we get to bring up his performance from 2001, uh, best actor in a lead role in the bedroom. Oof. If you want to, if you want to like just learn about the craft and what it means to kind of go through the emotions of a character, watch fucking in the bedroom. Sissy Spacek and Tom Wilkinson are putting on a clinic. They, they're just, they're on like a different playing field than a lot of other actors in that movie specifically. It's an actor's movie. It's like a, it's a screenplay that actors would just chomp at. Cause it's like, holy shit, I get to do all this and like incredible stuff that humans go through. And Tom, it knocks it out of the park in that movie. I think that was our fourth episode ever on Oscar Sunday. And I just still f- think about it all the time. I think about that, that first experience going into, you know, Todd Field's mind and just being kind of like, Whoa, this is, this is like what I thought was Oscar bait you know, for so many years, but really is like one of the most effective dramas I've seen in my life. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I love that movie. And he's great. Michael Clayton. He's my, probably my favorite, uh, like kind of heat check performance within the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy. Good God. What a scary, scary scene that is in that diner, you know, like him and Kirsten Bale going toe to toe was really cool. <laughs> Not everyone in Gotham is afraid of you. Only those who know me, kid. Yeah. God. So good. Carmine so good. Falcone. What a everyone talks about Joker and Two Face and Scarecrow. No one talks about Carmine, but that motherfucker's scary. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> scarier than the rest. That guy's got like he's his 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 fingers on the fucking button, you know. Joker's <laughs> like going around the button, like da-da-da-da-da, you know, and <laughs> other uh, you know, Scarecrow is like ultimately too weak to go to go toe to toe. And, but Tom Wilkinson's like, I, I'll bring that shit. I'll bring that pain. And that's really cool. Carmine. He, he runs Gotham. He's got nothing yep. to prove. He won already. Exactly. And that's yeah, cool. Like he's, he's at the top of that, that villain mountain already. He's, he's got like, he's a, a big part of my favorite um, Batman reveal in any Batman movie. When mm-hmm. he's, you know, when Bruce takes the costume out for a spin at the docks and, Carmine realizes all his men are gone. He's like, what the hell are you? And he punches through the glass of the car, pulls him up and just says, I'm Batman. It's like, fuck. Like, I believed it. (sighs) Fucking crazy. I love that movie to death. Um, Yeah, me too. (laughs) Have you ever seen the film The Full Monty? No, I've heard great things. Yeah. It's the strangest film ever nominated for Best Picture. It's a group of like steel workers get laid off in Scotland and decide to pull on, put on a all male stripper review with the promise of full male nudity, also called the full Monty. <laughs> and yeah. Tom Wilkins Perfect. is one of the gang, uh, Robert Carlyle's their leader. And the whole movie is them kind of learning how to put on a stripper routine and like getting up the courage to go full nudity in front of all these horny women in Scotland. It's a strange movie, but it works. <laughs> the song they dance Love to it. is hot stuff. <laughs> and it's just, Hell like, yeah, it's great. That's awesome. Because they're all like pudgy middle-aged Scots who like should not be doing this. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> I, I definitely need to see that at some point. Uh, Tom, Tom's the man. He is someone I'm looking forward to tripping up on performances by him and different stuff, you know. Uh, very interesting taste and very interesting choices like left and right. And yeah. I, I'm I've I've grown to really respect him. I used to just know him as Carmine. Now I'm yeah. like, oh no, that's that's Mr. Tom Wilkinson. 
<laughs> I just watched for the first time uh, Guy Ritchie's Rock and Rolla. Oh, which there you go. Was all right, but Wilkinson's the best part of the movie. He plays a a gritty, super sadistic English gangster, and like, what more could you want? <laughs> I, yeah, Tom Wilkinson's right. one of my favorite character actors, and I I get giddy every time I see him in a movie. I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. At least this part. Yeah, yeah. At least this little performance. Yeah, yeah. Tom, Tom, you're the man. Uh, we hope hope you get uh, you know, maybe another nomination. Uh, and as you're into your kind of older stages of your career, we love you here on Oscar Sunday. All right, one more performer, and then I got three uh, three people who worked, you know, behind the camera. Uh, last one is Owen Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Saving the saving the best for last. Uh, Owen Wilson was nominated with Wes Anderson for Best Screenplay, Royal Tenenbaums, 2001. He does not have a performance nomination. That's very unlikely. <laughs> I don't think that's happening with the, the with the likes of you know Wedding Crashers and the internship. Like I, I don't think that's happening. Uh, but Owen, I don't I don't ever want to ever want to talk ill of him he is a huge part of why uh wes got the jump start that he did he helped write ball rocket rushmore and tenon bombs uh they were buddies at ut in austin owen wilson also from here uh i believe he was born in dallas and they met in austin while going to school so this connection just this understanding of what they wanted to do happened, you know, their love for movies, their love for storytelling uh, and bottle rocket happens 1996 and fails miserably. And at the initial screening, people walked out of it because they had no idea what they were seeing. And Owen Wilson was about to go into the Marines. uh, When that, after that happened, he was like, well, clearly this isn't going to work out. Uh, Wes was not ready to give up. And convinced Owen to stay. Let's let's try this again. Let's try it again. And they wrote Rushmore. And it worked. And it was a box office. It was a surprising box office success. And then they do Tenenbaums. And they get nominated for a fucking Oscar. And they have their, you know, they have their Ben Affleck, uh, Matt Damon Oscar moment where it's like, wait, what? You know, that was, this can change everything. And it did for both of them. Uh, it did for Wes. Now he's able to make all these movies. and be trusted by uh, Indian Paintbrush, the production company that usually uh, helps fund his films and produce them and whatnot and distribute them. Uh, And then it allowed Owen Wilson to step into being one of the most used and popular comedic actors of the 2000s. And now now you look at them and they both formed very different, very interesting careers. And Owen always comes back to be in his movies because they just have this awesome bond. But he's he's been able to make like a shit ton of money being in all these like like wedding crashers, which was a fucking hit. You know, he's able to to just do that and be an actor and like make a living off of it because of that that little bond that they had. And they they wrote Bottle Rocket as a short and then made it into a feature length film. And I'll say this now because this isn't going to ruin my my top five. Uh, Dignan from Bottle Rocket is absolutely my favorite character that Wes Anderson or Owen Wilson, however you want to look at it, has ever written. Uh, Dignan is the predecessor to everything that happens. Uh, Him and Max Fisher and Rushmore is like, okay, you look at those two guys and you're going to be seeing what Wes is going to be playing with over and over and over. You're not quite sure if Dignan is, has completely lost his mind or if he's a fucking genius. You're, You're like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I mean, he has a spiral notebook when he picks up his friend. He picks him up and uh, Luke Wilson, played by his brother, really cool. He has a spiral that has the next 75 years planned out. (laughs) And you're like, what's wrong with this guy? But his commitment speaks volumes about the commitment Wes Anderson just has to his characters and to bringing them to life and being true to them. And causing them to become a part of your own life as, as the audience. Very cool. Very cool. I love Dignan so much. You know, they'll never fucking catch me because I'm innocent. You know? <laughs> That's I, I, I love, 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 love all that stuff in, in Ball Rocket. Dignan is 
one of the reasons I fell in love with everything Wes Anderson. You know, he when I saw that movie, I was like, holy shit, this is crazy. And Dignan is just blows my mind when he's wearing the full yellow jumpsuit. <laughs> and, and then the other Wilson brother who plays the, the Bob's dickhead brother, yeah. he comes up and he's like, what are you wearing? <laughs> he's like, it's a jumpsuit. He's like, oh my God. He's like, wait, what's that? What's the name of that uh, landscaping company? Uh, that you're the Lone Wranglers <laughs> with James Conn. Come on. Yeah. You know, it's just, just crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, definitely going to be sharing more thoughts about ball rocket, but there's no question in my mind that Dignan is kind of the apex for Wes Anderson characters in my mind. Uh, I love him to death. And I think he's always been chasing that kind of character ever since he made him in 1996. He's always been like, how can I, how can I do that again? You know, cause that was just too much fun. He said, don't worry. Don't worry guys. Crime pays. <laughs> It cuts to the hotel that they're staying in. It's just a piece of shit. (laughs) Oh, I love Dignan so much. And Owen Wilson, for as, you know, strange as his career has been and his personal life has been, I'll I'll always be appreciative of what he's done for for Wes and for those first three movies. For me, I knew knew exactly what Dignan was about when he orchestrates a prison break for his friend who is staying voluntarily at a mental... Hospital. Yeah. Did you bribe the janitor? (laughs) He's just like, what? Like, it's it's my friend. He thinks that's a prison break. It'll break his heart if I tell him it's not. And the therapist is like, all right, but clean this up. This this doesn't look good for anybody. (laughs) Yeah, this doesn't look good. (laughs) Yeah, I've always loved Owen Wilson. Um, you mentioned Midnight in Paris earlier. That's probably my favorite uh performance of his because I can relate to that so much. Great role, yeah. Embracing the you know the history of a place and the legacy of the art it created, and having nobody around you give a fuck. It's yeah. it's unfortunate. Uh, it's a big part of why I started this podcast because I was like, I want to talk about this shit with people who care about it as much as I do. Yeah, yeah, straight up. Yeah, that's why I keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, uh, Owen Wilson's the man. Underappreciated, I think, but. You know, with the whole with him getting the role of you know Mobius in that Loki show, I think a whole new generations about to find him. That's that's great. Yeah, that that was such a cool choice to have him in that. It definitely got me. You know, it took a while for me to watch. Uh, fuck, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> WandaVision. It took me a long time to like finally like watch that and finish it. With with Loki, I was like, I, I'm like so all in because of him, you know, putting putting Dignan <laughs> and into the MCU just just changed my entire attitude about it. So uh, hats off to Marvel for doing that. They do that constantly. They just put everybody's favorite stars in their in their stuff, and then they actually follow through by making pretty good content. So great great casting decision. Uh, that's that's it for performers only uh 14 <laughs> jesus <laughs> yeah we just we just uh took a long time to get through those but it, it's so much fun talking about these different performers and what they kind of mean to us uh, and obviously this being a 2014 film all of these performers have been working while we've been alive uh through through our movie watching uh careers if you if you will and that's that's really special you know again I think Willem Dafoe and Norton are my two like favorite actors on this list. I think maybe Saoirse Ronan's third. I don't know. It's really hard. Tom Wilkinson. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's uh, it's such an incredible ensemble for me. It's it's Ray Fiennes. Yeah. Um, it's Dafoe, and you know what? I think it's probably Goldblum. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum, so <laughs> good. Bill Murray, fucking Bill Murray. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. I also love uh, music in, in Wes Anderson movies. Uh, he's got a lot of cool people to do scores for him. And then his personal touch on the soundtracks is one of his trademarks. Uh, he's, he rivals Scorsese and the needle drop. He knows how to use the Beatles the right way. He knows how to use the Rolling Stones the right way. He knows how to use the who he knows how to use velvet underground, like these incredibly popular, his use of Bob Dylan, he knows how to use them correctly. These massive, huge artists 
that he's obsessed with from the sixties and seventies and so forth. And uh, putting them in his films, it just makes it, it makes the movies timeless and it's extremely effective as a, as a, as a member of the audience. But uh, the score for uh, Grand Budapest Hotel is composed by Alexandre Desplat. And he has a very, very cool resume. Uh, his, his nominations are, it's quite a long list. So bear with us here. Uh, the Queen, 2006. Uh, the Curious Case of Benjamin Button, 2008. Decent start. Uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, 2009. The King's Speech, 2010. Argo, 2012. Philomena, 2013. <laughs> the Imitation Game, 2014. And he's got two wins in a row for Grand Budapest Hotel, 2014, and Shape of Water, 2017. And he's nominated again in 2018 for Isle of Dogs. And then his last nomination is Little Women, 2019. Woof! What a run. <laughs> These movies are all very relevant when it comes to the Oscars. Uh, there's three Best Picture winners in here. King's Speech, Argo, and Shape of Water. Holy shit. <laughs> Alexandre Desplat is one of my favorite composers. Um, he did the music for the final Harry Potter movie. Mm. Uh, and uh, really helped elevate that thing with a sense of finality, which was beautiful. Um, but my all-time favorite score of his is The Imitation Game. The music in that movie is fucking gorgeous. Uh, I wish he'd been nominated for his score for The Danish Girl, which was amazing. Yeah, um, best, best part of that movie for me. Yeah, I, I think he's incredibly talented. I love that he's got two Oscars. Usually my favorite composers don't have any. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, he's the man. He's fantastic with Anderson, clearly. Uh, they've done a few films together. And uh, did he do? Yep, he did the French Dispatch as well. <laughs> yes, sir. And Moonrise Kingdom. Yeah, he's definitely been involved with uh, Wes Anderson. Oh, great! Yeah, I'm I'm looking at his his filmography here, and it's just so much gold. Yeah, truly, he could kind of have his own episode. He's that kind of composer that has a range that's really incredible. Worked with all these incredible directors, and has two wins, so a really easy jumping off point. I love that sandwich between the imitation game and the Grand Budapest Hotel is fucking Godzilla. Hell yeah. <laughs> of course. That's awesome. Is that the, the Brian Cranston one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've only seen that once and I thought it was all right. It's, it's underwhelming and King of the Monsters and Godzilla versus Kong were so much better, but only because they were bigger. Yeah, which it needs to be big if you're going to. Yeah, it's Godzilla. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna fucking do it, you gotta really yeah. do it. I don't give a damn about anybody's any soldier's like journey to find their wife in the carnage. I want to see the big lizard fight the big three headed alien dragon. That's all I'm here to see. <laughs> fucking same here. <laughs> same here. I don't think I don't think anybody's gonna argue with that one. If they do, they don't know what they're watching. You know. <laughs> uh, oh. Two more. Two more individuals, then we'll then we'll go to the 87th Academy Awards to look at more uh, stuff from 2014. Uh, Adam Stockhausen. It's time, time to talk about the production design. Uh, he is uh, clearly very talented. You know, worked on Grand Budapest, which is a uh, a feat when it comes to the way it looks, and that's why I, that's why I think he won uh, in 2014 for Grand Budapest Hotel. Was also nominated uh, the year before, uh, 2013, 12 Years a Slave. Decent film. Uh, and then 2015, A Bridge of Spies, he was nominated. So three nominations in a row, 2013, 2014, 2015. One win for, I think, the most effective movie on that front. Uh, out of the three, you know, he worked on Moonrise Kingdom, Isle of Dogs. He's French Dispatch, uh, has a Darjeeling. He has a connection to Wes and has an understanding of how grand everything needs to be uh how every single frame in the film is like its own masterpiece is its own art piece and that is probably why they are so rewatchable of course the you know the characters are a lot of fun and the stories are, are really interesting and Wes makes you interested about stuff you didn't know you'd be interested in but the way they look offers a rewatchability that is rare because you're looking at stuff that's new every time 
you're, you know, I think, I think with a lot of movies, you catch new stuff. You might catch like a new little bit from a character, a new little bit of dialogue, but with Wes Anderson movies, it takes like 10 watches to fully cover, especially Budapest hotel. It's like so visually stunning and the colors are so fucking vibrant and so cool and everything in place, like the Mendel stuff, the bakery stuff. Are you kidding me? Like who, how did you do all that stuff? What, what kind of patience does it take to make sure there's 45 boxes uh, in this frame instead of, instead of 35, you know, to make everything look so perfect. It's like, they're, 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 they're just on like a different, different level when it comes to understanding what's going to be compelling to a viewer who's going to keep coming back. And I, I can't get over how beautiful all of these movies are. And if anything, if you don't like the writing style or you don't like whatever, like how can you not enjoy just the palette that Wes Anderson and Adam Stockhouse and, and company have created for us? You know, it's just, it's astonishing. It's, it's a gorgeous sorbet of a film. It's just delightful. <laughs> Yeah. It's pleasant, but I, it's, I read an article about this movie uh, describing it was about the production design. Um, every newspaper and magazine that appears in this movie, even if it's just fleeting on a desk somewhere, was handwritten with actual like with fictional stories about this t- fake town. Like it's full of details that never come up in the movie or never even looked at, but are just there to enhance the tone and feel of this movie. And that is a dedication that earns Oscars. That is amazing. And yeah. I mean, no wonder he took home the gold for production design for this. Who was going to beat this? Nobody. This is nuts. And from the trail, it looks like French Dispatch is going to have the same level of gorgeous attention to detail that just mm-hmm. enhances your experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's mostly what I'm looking forward to. You know, going to be able to like being able to see it in theaters, uh, see a Wes Anderson movie in theaters is like, I know I'm going to buy this movie at some point. I know I'm going to own it. I'm going to be able to rewatch it. But that first time, I'm just going to just try to soak all of it up. You know, just soak it all in. All the colors, the palette, everything that he's trying to do. I'll catch on to a lot of the other character stuff later. I'm going to just let this stun me. And I, I've taken that mindset into any movie I've watched of his. And I'm always rewarded by... Okay, you 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 recognize how beautiful and gorgeous it is. Now have fun with the characters. Now have fun with the story. And I, that's just my freaky way of rewatching stuff and kind of learning more about each movie. And uh, of course, listening to like, interviews with Wes helps a lot because he's just he's like brutal when it comes to like you said. That's so crazy that each newspaper is its own thing, its own little entity. And that, like he, when it comes to that, he's a wholesome and calm guy when he's talking, but in his mind, you know, that it's just madness. You know, it's just like, everything has to be just like this and everything's got to be, has, has to be with intent. And I, oh, that's so cool. As, as someone who just watches movies over and over, you can't help but admire that kind of commitment to his, to his own craft over and over, not just one movie, like over and over. It's like when Stanley Kubrick died, his like artistic talent split into Wes Anderson and Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah, the Andersons. Yeah. The good side went into Wes and the darker side went into <laughs> Paul Thomas. That's, that's the way I see it sometimes. Neither one of them are quite as good as Kubrick, <laughs> but, but they both have pieces. Yeah, I love that. That's fantastic. Wes Anderson names Kubrick as one of his one of his main you know, yeah. influences. I mean, who, who isn't, you know, someone who's making movies in the nineties, most likely they were watching Kubrick in the fifties, sixties, seventies. Well, and somebody who's so like embraces the attention to detail, the mm-hmm. perfectionism, you're going to, this is somebody who, who like watched and really analyzed Kubrick. You can, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Last individual here. Just finishing off with uh, one one of the one of the stronger individuals that that we're talking about here. Uh, don't know how to properly say her last name. I'm gonna try my best. Milena Cananero. I would. That's that's, that's my best guess. That's she, good. Uh, good lord, good lord almighty, costume designer in Grand Budapest Hotel. Also, the costume design 
designer and, and some other Wes Anderson stuff, but most notably to me, her most in, uh, incredible feat is the production design, or, or sorry, costume design in uh, Marie Antoinette from 2006. Holy fucking hell. That movie is in the same plane as some of Wes Anderson stuff, just because it's like, what? <laughs> you guys did all of that for a movie? You know, like we appreciate that. You know, people who watch movies are like, yes, thank you. You took that shit really seriously. And she's, I mean, she's won four fucking Oscars. So let's just get down to it. Uh, right off the bat, look at this. Barry Lyndon, 1975, winner for best costume design. Chariots of Fire, 1981, winner for best costume design. Uh, best costume design nominee, uh, Out of Africa, 1985. Uh, Tucker, The Man and His Dream, 1988. Dick Tracy, 1990. Uh, Titus, 1999. Yeah, t- fucking Titus. I haven't seen that, but I've heard it's nuts. Uh, the Affair of the Necklace, 2001. Uh, then one for Marie Antoinette and Grand, Pe- Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> well, I mean, we were like we were just talking about Anderson's, you know, <laughs> yeah. influenced by Kubrick. So what does he does? He fucking grabs Kubrick's costume designer from Barry Lyndon. Yeah. I mean, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, really Jeez. cool. That uh, yeah, that's so it starts off with two wins: Barry Lyndon, Chariots of Fire. And then has finished the Oscar resume with two wins, Marie Antoinette and Grand Budapest. There could be more in the future. I'm not, I'm not, not totally sure, but she's left her mark. Like, you know, she doesn't really need to do anything else. She's left her mark. Like this is a crazy filmography. Dude. Uh, if you, if you keep looking at it, yeah, you see some amazing stuff. <laughs> not only was she on Barry Lyndon, she did the costumes for a clockwork orange and the shining. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. She, <sighs> She basically got her career started with Kubrick. Uh, I don't know how that is like your first experience in the movie world, uh, working with a freak like that. But sign me up. That'd be awesome. <laughs> she did Death and the Maiden. Uh, incredible movie. The Wolfman. Carnage. Like she's worked with some incredible. Like, who is this lady? Like <laughs> the the story a, she must have. She's a freak. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think she, uh, like Alexandra Desplat, I think could like have her own episode on Oscar Sunday where you're like, let's just look at more of her movies and check them out, you know, and see the things we haven't seen. Cause she's, uh, she's lights out her IMDb picture is awesome. She's holding up an Oscar. It's so cool. <laughs> I love when, when people get to do that. Just like, yeah. yeah, this is who I am now. Academy award winner. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> I love it, man. Uh, that was a lot of fun just talking about all these people that make up Budapest. Uh, I think we should briefly look at the nine nominations that uh, Budapest got at the 87th Academy Awards and just kind of look at 2014 because that's definitely one of our favorite years. We've talked about how effective it is. Uh, you know, I think personally speaking, I was going through my ultimate movie mode like okay it's time it's time to just dive in as far as i can and that's because of movies like budapest and whiplash and boyhood uh, and birdman those movies that came out that year that were kind of oscar you know season movies just just blew me away and i felt so grateful for them and it caused me to become obsessed you know uh it was it was a storm that was brewing and then it, it, it fucking exploded. It went off in 2014 and it hasn't really stopped. It's just gotten bigger and louder and more, more annoying in my head. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty wild because 2014 was the year that I decided what kind of film buff I was going to be. Yeah. Uh, this was the year that filmgasm.com was founded by Caleb yes. and I, where we made the pact to watch everything we could find. And this was the first Oscar uh award season that I was actually paying attention to everything and I was watching everything I could find and I embraced it and I just never looked back. So this is a pretty formative year for me as well. Uh, sweet. Yeah. Really cool. I've always loved that, that we, you know, we didn't meet until like late 2017, but I think that our brains were connected in 2014. We we're like, uh, movies, you know, just, this is, this is it for me now. I'm choosing this over everything else. Uh, I still like a lot of other stuff. You know, I try to keep up with some, some of the music these days and I try to 
watch a few TV shows here and there, like Succession. That shit is fucking awesome. Uh, that that just came back recently. So, you know, I, I try to branch out a little bit. I love sports. I love soccer. But movies is just it just destroys all of them. It just runs the show in my world. I have I've I've been pretty adamant about where I'm at. Uh, film is pretty much like dominating almost every aspect of my life. TV occasionally. I have like shows I like that I keep up with, but it's very rare that I'll actually just sit down and start a new show at this point. Yeah. Uh, then it's music, same deal. Like there's bands I like, I follow them, but you know, if I hear a good, I, I, I follow songs more than I follow artists. That's totally fair. I think I'm a bit opposite there where I'm just kind of like, Oh, this band put out this new album. I have to listen to it. And that kind of, kind of puts me in a corner sometimes. And I, 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 I know that I should probably just stop trying to be like a perfectionist with listening to the full album. Like, Oh, I need to know what they sound like now. You know, it's like, it's okay, man. Listen to a couple songs. <laughs> uh, 87th Academy Awards. Like obviously a very important year for you and I, uh, as viewers, Birdman won the big award, best picture, but Budapest equaled it, tied it for most nominations at the show with nine fucking nine. Uh, also, tied it for total wins with four. I don't think that any of the Budapest wins are as important as the big Birdman one, but hey, still got four wins. Yeah, gold is gold. Yeah, and I, I want to go through those today. All right, well, let's start at the bottom of IMDb with the nominations. Uh, best original screenplay is our first one. We have Boyhood, Foxcatcher, the Grand Budapest Hotel, Nightcrawler, and the winner, Birdman. Uh, that's a pretty formidable bunch of screenplays right there. Yeah, good Lord. I'd say uh, Foxcatcher, it's my least favorite, but these other four are pretty powerful. Uh, I, I don't think Boyhood is. And I think it's a good movie. I think it's a strong movie. I don't think its screenplay is particularly memorable. That's fair. That's fair. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely a sucker for that movie. Uh, Link later, just like Wes is a, like a Texas legend to me. And I'm kind of just like all in almost no matter what. That's a bit of bias for me, for sure. But I do think, uh, you know, I think Budapest, Nightcrawler and Birdman, which one, like which one of those three would you say should win? Uh, um, Birdman's a fun movie. Uh, it's pretty unique. I, I don't think it should have taken best picture. Uh Screenplay though, up against Grand Budapest, that's that's a tough. Mm. Ah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to Grand Budapest. I think the the story of this movie is so witty and charming. The dialogue is just so it pops and uh, it's witty. And I, I love I love I love a nice wit. So Budapest. Yeah, me too. Me too. I I think I'd vote the exact same. Uh, it's just. We, we've spoken about kind of through and through masterpiece screenplays, and they're usually ones that are tight like Budapest and, and runtime, but with a lot, of, lot, lot of stuff to say, a lot of interesting takes on history, and then just humor that will kind of get you every time. Uh, you know, on each rewatch, it just gets funnier and funnier every time. So, yeah, I think I'm in the same boat as you. Nice. Uh, that takes us to best film editing. Uh, this is weirdly, this is my favorite category of this Oscars. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute here. Um, we have American Sniper, Boyhood, The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Imitation Game, and the winner, Whiplash. Blink later worked on Boyhood for 10 years. He had 10 years of footage to edit into a coherent narrative. Any other year, that is the shoe in for film editing. And then Whiplash comes along and blows it out of the water. I, I love that so much. And I give this to Whiplash any day of the week. Yeah, same. Uh, Whiplash to me is the best movie from this entire ceremony. Uh, yeah. We did an episode on it early in our, in our go here on Oscar Sunday. We were both just super amped about it. And had to talk about it. I would I would even redo it. I love Whiplash so much, and it 
is like a, a easy, easy masterpiece kind of movie to me. Uh, some films I understand why someone wouldn't connect with it, but Whiplash is like, are you human? Do you have a pulse? <laughs> it, th- this should work on you. Uh, but you're, you're right. Boyhood, Sandra Adair, the work that her and Linklater did is revolutionary. Like it's, it's an idea that I'm sure tons of people had, but never wanted to actually go through it. And it would have been cool to see them rewarded for that. But I mean, give it to the better product. And that's, that's whiplash. Yep. I think we're in agreement there. Um, yeah. Imitation game is pretty awesome though. <laughs> true. But does, is it, is it really revolutionary in the way it's edited? No, 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 no. It's it's got a cool pace. I like the pace to it, but no, I, I've seen that before. You know, I've seen yeah. I've seen something like that before for the past you know few decades. Yeah, and then I'll never really understand the splash American Sniper made at this at this awards. I it's an okay movie. It's not revolutionary. I think it's fairly dishonest and uh, more propaganda than anything else. Yeah, I would say that every single movie. This is rare. Every single movie in the best best visual effects category is better than that movie interstellar captain america winter soldier dawn of the yeah. planet of the apes gardens of the galaxy and x-men days of future past they're like Jesus. all better than that movie yeah those are five incredible those are three nines and two tens for me <laughs> christ <laughs> yeah yeah those movie those movies kick ass winter soldier is one of the best marvel movies in my opinion and uh gardens of the galaxy is is a strong a strong one dawn is great days of future past is great yeah this is a fucking killer group that would just in my opinion shatter american sniper one of my coolest movie theater memories is seeing x-men days of future past and not realizing that they were going to use the score from x-men 2 and then when it broke in and like the opening credits rolled and i'm like that's the x-men 2 music like the child inside of me had a fucking heart attack and i was just like holy shit this is gonna be cool and i yeah. was right <laughs> Um, Fantastic. Yeah. That takes us to Best Cinematography. We have The Grand Budapest Hotel by Robert Yauman, Ida by Lucas Zal and Rizard Linzuski. My apologies. Uh, Mr. Turner by Dick Pope. It's a fantastic name. Unbroken by Roger Deakins. And the winner, Birdman by Emmanuel Lubezki. Uh, I think this goes to Birdman yeah. straight up. This one's the yeah. I think Birdman, the strongest thing it has going for it, moving on, moving forward, is some of the stuff like backstage. And as Michael, as Michael Keaton is kind of moving his way through this huge place that is actually not that giant, you know, and they make it seem like every little corner is just there's something right around it or someone waiting. It's really cool. It makes you kind of fantasize about just like the theater business and show business. And and I, I love that about Birdman. It makes it kind of a Makes it kind of like a, a classic in my in my head uh, that 20, 30 years from now, you look back at Birdman and be like, wow, that guy, you know, whoever was working on that really had something to had something to say with the camera there. When I'm a sucker for long, uninterrupted takes, yeah, those always blow my mind. Like, how did they do this? And Birdman's full of that. Uh, plus, I really fucking hated Mr. Turner, and I don't like that it's at this award like at all. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the most boring, pointless movies I've ever watched. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, are, are you a fan? Uh, not, not, I'm not, I'm in the middle. I'm neutral. It's whatever. Uh, <laughs> Timothy Spall, he's cool. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, that's best director. This is an interesting bunch. Uh, Richard Linklater for Boyhood. Bennett Miller for Foxcatcher. Wes Anderson for the Grand Budapest, Morton Tildum for the Imitation Game, and the winner Alejandro Inaritu for Birdman, the first of his consecutive back-to-back wins for directing. Um, where in the hell is Damien Chazelle? Yeah, they didn't want to do it, man. It's his first, his first, first feature. They didn't want to do it. Ah, fucking, he, fucking he's eight. more deserving than anyone here. Yeah, and you know this this is one of those years where it could have been, you know, they could have done something that would have just broken my brain you know you take bennett miller out and morton tilled him out and you could put david fincher in for gone girl and you could put paul thomas anderson in for inherent vice and you just break my whole 
<laughs> break my whole world. No to Paul Thomas Anderson, because I do not care for inherent vice. <laughs> I say give that slot to Ava DuVernay for Selma. Selma's Selma's legit. All right. Yeah. I like I like I, I enjoy Selma. I, I, I like that story. I think it's an underappreciated film. I think it's weird to give a film a nomination for best picture and then best song and with nothing else. Yeah, that's it. Just weird. Yeah. Gimmicky. A mm, little bit. Uh, but yeah, I think of the five we've got here, director. Honestly, I think Link later probably should have taken this. That would be my vote. Uh, I think I think Wes has something to say, but Linklater, um, that control over that long of time and that willingness to not be in control and know that these people are actually going to age and they're going to look different and they may be acting differently as they get older. Uh, very, very cool. And to have kind of the partnership he does with, you know, Ethan Hawke and Patricia Arquette, <clears throat> where they were really the leaders of this of this project, uh, you know they're they're dealing with children actors who aren't really actors. You know, Laura Lee Linklater, Richard's daughter, and Eller Coltrane, who plays Mason, the main, the boy in the movie. Like, it's not really his like passion anymore. You know, is like so they took that risk of being in control of something so special, but being out of control of how exactly it was going to look as they moved forward. And I, I love that about Boyhood. I think Linklater showed a tremendous amount of composure, composure during that process. And the end product is pretty damn good, pretty damn affecting, uh, especially for a three-hour drama. You know, it's, it's pretty, pretty stirring. Well, like, you know, not counting, like, children, investing that much time into a project is relatively unheard of. Uh, yeah, yeah. And if anything had gone wrong, you know, you lose a little bit of the footage from 2001. You, you got nothing for that part of the movie. Like if somebody yeah. you know gets in an accident, that's it. That's 10 years down the drain. So, I mean, it's amazing. They, anybody they, did Linklater pay for this one out of pocket. Like did any studio want to invest in this? Yeah. He pretty much did it as he went. Yeah. It's pretty much his, his deal. A lot well, of make, makes sense. A lot of really cool shots of him getting to wherever they're going to film and because they would film one weekend each year that's what that's how they did it they would so it's kind of like a family reunion and he's like the godfather like he's just like yeah come on let's go let's have a good time and continue making our little project bit by bit into this again three hour like epic drama really cool uh yeah i love that movie i i like it i've seen it one time uh I remember thinking like, yeah, this is kind of gimmicky, but also this is, there's a lot of love in this movie. Um, yeah. I would definitely like to watch it again with a more experienced eye. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I'm always willing to like watch more boyhood. The patience it takes uh, to sit down and watch that is, is a lot, but if you like link later and you like uh, that kind of experimental stuff, uh, best picture. <laughs> um it's one of those years with where we've got a whole bunch. Uh, I don't, I really don't like that they ever did this, but you know, no, I mean, it, it is what it is. Uh, we've got American Sniper, Boyhood, The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Imitation Game, Selma, The Theory of Everything, Whiplash, and the winner, Birdman. Um, as we've said numerous times, the star of this Oscars is Whiplash. Yeah. That movie's lights out, incredible. And a truly unforgettable musical drama. Well, not music, music drama. Uh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And, and then not to, you know, can't, I won't be able to sleep at night if, uh, you know, J.K. Simmons, one of the best villains of the 2010s. Oh, my God, he's terrifying. And he's so unflinchingly real. Like, this is, you know, teachers... There's good, there's good teachers and there's bad teachers. And then there's Terrence Fletcher. <laughs> and mm, yes, oh my God, this guy's a monster, but he gets results. That's the thing, you know, like there's no way this school didn't know what he's doing. I mean, he's been doing this for decades, Yep. but his bands win, you know, they, they win. They always win. 
and oh yeah there's i've I've watched this movie thinking like oh detmer's getting abused here and then i've watched this movie thinking like no fletcher's turning this block of marble into a statue and then i've watched it thinking like he's a so he's a sociopath and i've watched it thinking like no he's a genius and like there's so many different angles you can view this movie it's fucking crazy yeah i love it man so much uh whiplash is a yeah it's a masterpiece it's one that again i wouldn't be surprised if we just redid on oscar sunday just because it's that good i would love to give that movie awards to give it the the uh morricone award that would be tough <laughs> oh jesus good luck yeah oh yeah maybe you know what maybe I, I, i'd be down me too maybe a couple of years from now or something you know we'll just yeah. come back to it <laughs> uh so now it's time for the four wins uh first up production design uh we have the imitation game interstellar into the woods mr turner and the winner the grand budapest hotel of fucking course who else is going to take this one the yeah we talked about the production even, design here. It's it's next to godliness. There's just no there's no way it's being taken away. Yeah. None of these are being these four wins. Nope. Um anything here you think had like a potential runner up chance if Ray Budapest had somehow not gotten the nomination? Interstellar. Interstellar. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, the rest are like, yeah, not even close. <laughs> yeah, weird. Uh, best original score. We have The Imitation Game by Alexandre Despla, Interstellar by Hans Zimmer, Mr. Turner by Gary Yershin, Theory of Everything by Johan Johansson, and the winner, The Grand Budapest Hotel by Alexandre Despla. Two nominations, one win at this award. Yeah, pretty impressive. And this is this, I feel the same way. I think nothing's like you, I don't think. Budapest was ever going to lose this, but Hans Zimmer interstellar score is pretty awesome. So that's second place. I honestly don't have a great affinity for the Grand Budapest Hotel score. If oh, Dis- wow. I know. Oh. Yeah. If Despla was going to win this, I would have wanted him to take it for the imitation game, but I really wanted Johan Johansson to win this for the theory of everything. That film is one of my favorite scores of all time. It is so beautiful and it's so haunting, but it's so inspiring. Mm. And that's the best stuff from a score, right? Is to, Get you in all those different emotions. Yeah. And then Johan Johansson, um, I think he committed suicide a few years ago. Uh, so his, his work is gone or, or his future, his potential is gone, but we'll always have scores like this. And um, Sicario as well was one of his. Hmm. Uh, he was just great. Um, best makeup. We have... Foxcatcher, Guardians of the Galaxy, and the winner, Grand Budapest. Um, I think it would have been neat to see Guardians take this. Yeah, it certainly is a, you know, I think more work <laughs> than <laughs> than Budapest uh, overall in that department. You know, you can't can't really have the Marvel movies without makeup. But uh, this is a weird weird group. Uh, Foxcatcher, you know, they do pretty drastic things to Steve Carell. Hmm. But yeah, these other two movies are definitely a level ahead. I think Budapest just did what the Academy wants from a film for this category. Like uh, they like those period pieces. They like shouting out, you know, old Europe and stuff like that. And, you know, especially they, they love they love themselves a good 20th century, you know, movie with with all kinds of different mustaches and old hairstyles. They, they love that shit. The Academy eats that up. That's true. That's true. Finally, best costume design. Uh, Inherent Vice, Into the Woods, Maleficent, Mr. Turner, and the winner, The Grand Budapest. Uh, absolutely. This is right up there with production design. The costume design in this film is beautiful. Everyone's costume is so unique and, you know, personable to their, like, personal to their character. Even the you know faux Nazis we get, yeah, uh, it's it's lights out. I don't think anyone else was uh, going to take this one. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. This is this is Milena. This is our girl who worked with Kubrick in the seventies, uh, and here she is, just yeah, getting an easy easy win uh, for costume design. Yeah, man, I think I think those technical awards like it it just deserved those, just deserved them. It's 
even if it didn't have all these stars and it, it had a bunch of no name actors, it would still be good because all that shit's on point And that's awesome. Yeah. Just the people who want to work with Anderson, just enhance the, like I keep saying this phrase, but enhance the experience. It really does. Just, yeah. And it just keeps enhancing it. I mean, French dispatch, like I said, has like the biggest ensemble he's ever worked with. And then his next film, I'm sure is going to somehow go further. Yeah, probably. It pro- he'll, he'll probably be able to, you know, spend more money and, you know, he's 52 right now. So as he gets into his, you know, his sixties and seventies, you would hope that he just gets to do really whatever the fuck he wants as he's been on that track for a while now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Very nice. So that's the, uh, 87th, um, I think probably good time to give our awards. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go ahead and finish this thing off. Uh, we have the Tarantino award for best line or, Best quote, however you want to look at it. Uh, then we have the Ennio Morricone Award for best music moment in the film. Uh, then we have the Philip Seymour Hoffman Award for best performance of the movie. And then we have the Roger Deakins Award for the best scene or moment from the movie. So I'll let you start us off with your Tarantino. I have two, and they are both from Monsieur Gustave. Okay. My first comes from when Zero first visits Gustav in prison and Gustav shows up with two black eyes and yeah. Zero asks him, what happened? And he responds with, what happened, my dear Zero, is I beat the living shit out of a sniveling little runt called P- Pinky Bandinsky, who had the gall to question my virility. Because if there's one thing we've learned from Penny Dreadfuls, it's that when you find yourself in a place like this, you must never be a candy ass. You've got to prove yourself from day one. You've got to win their respect. You should take a long look at his ugly mug this morning. And it's told with this, like, this life lesson t- tone of, like, remember this, young man. <laughs> and it's just yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. That's the best stuff. Best stuff from Gustav is, like, it, he believes whatever he's saying is just the most important thing being said in the room. And he's like, yeah, you, you, I know from experience, okay, young, young. Even if he's just bullshitting, if he's just lying, you know, <laughs> it's awesome. That's that. I love that. And then my other one, because it just made me laugh so much, was when they're trying to find Serge and they go through all that shit with the monks and they end up in the confession booth. And Gustav just wants answers about this second copy of the second will. And he just asks Serge, well, what does it say? Where is it? What's it all about? Damn it. Don't keep us in suspense, Serge. This, this has been a complete fucking nightmare. Just tell us what the fuck is going on. <laughs> and then he gets killed by Willem Dafoe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I wrote that exact same one down. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that second one. Cause yeah, when he's like, just tell us what the fuck's going on. <laughs> he's just, he's just, he's lost it at that point. And us in the movie, we're like, come on. Like as the audience, we're, we're, we're we have the same attitude. Like someone spilled the fucking beans already. <laughs> and, and it's, it's perfect. That attention to detail and the awareness of knowing the screenplay is so aware of where we're going to be when it gets to each point, it's like, Oh my God, you know, uh, that I wrote that one down. And then my favorite one that I just say, uh, and now, you know, I'll be saying it a lot more often, uh, probably on this show after this episode is keep your hands off my lobby boy. <laughs> oh, I love that line so much. Fascist assholes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> Rafe hats off to you, man. He should have been nominated. It's all yes. good. Yes, you should have. <laughs> oh, great picks. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I love when that happens. Uh, that that part is so good with uh, Serge <laughs> in the booth. Such an incredible scene. It was like it was like almost my deacon. It's such a great scene. Uh, the Ennio Morricone Award, best uh, music moment. What do you got? There's this bit of dark, kind of bouncy score that follows Jopling around the whole movie. Mm. It's playing when he's hunting Goldblum. <laughs> that little bit of Goldblum's just holding up the bag containing the cat. I always get a yeah. chuckle out of how dark that is. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I love that little score because it's like you know I love a good villain theme, and that's that's Joplin's villain theme. I don't know what it's called, but it's a very recognizable bit of the score. I think it's called. I think I, I'm pretty sure I would have to like listen to it for a minute. But from the from the titles of the the tracks, 
it might just be called job playing private inquiry agent. I think, I think that might be what, what, what the, like that particular sound you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. It's it, you can't miss it. That's a safe bet. I think that that's probably it. That's, that's probably it. There's so many tracks on here. It's 32 songs. Uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, my favorite is the society of the crossed keys. And that's <laughs> the song that's playing. Obviously when, you learn about what that is and all these different hotels calling to one another. You know, that's when we see Bill Murray, like you mentioned earlier, that scene is so cool because it's Wes Anderson doing one of my favorite things that he does, which is you're in a specific world. And even, and this is this, this also speaks to that, that fact that you mentioned about the newspapers having real stories on each one that are all different. He has a movie or two inside of every idea that he has everything that he does. It's like, Holy shit, we could just go over there and that's a whole nother movie. Or we could just go here and that's a whole nother movie. You know, you can go to each one of these hotels and each one of them, as they, you know, get the, they get the call, they tell their lobby boy, take over. (laughs) And and that is just, is such a skill for you. Your, your, your mind can be wandering about these different ideas that he has that he's just giving you like a tiny glimpse of. And then you're right back where you are. Cause you're like, Oh, something pulled you back in. And it's, it's either a good piece of screenplay or it's, or it's Ray Fiennes just screaming, or it's a really cool, really cool shot of Willem Dafoe uh, skiing with zero and Gustav on a sled behind them. Like it's just all that stuff is, is to me, the genius of Wes Anderson is that there's, like thousands of ideas inside of every movie and he can make a movie about all those ideas, but he chose this one and you're like, I'm, I want to be here. This is exactly where I want to be. I'm wandering, but then I'm right back where I, where I need to be for, for, to watch this movie. And that, that part, uh, the society of the crossed keys does that for me. And the music's so cool. I listen to it all the time. I love this score. I, I love a uh, zero's theme. It's called the war. I love Zero's theme. It's really cool. I also love No Safe House. And that's whenever <laughs> Gustav finds out, what? <laughs> He's like, this is a disaster. <laughs> and then he finds out that Zero's like dad was killed and they had to run because of the war. And he's like, shame on me. <laughs> I, I, you know, and he's like, no, man, you didn't know. And he's like, don't make excuses for me. <laughs> I, I love all that stuff. And it's always like my favorite scenes that I, I, I pair it with whatever music's playing. And that's the most effective for me. Uh, so th- those bits are, are the best. Uh, Alexander Dis- Displat is, is fantastic. I suggest people just go check his work out. You know, uh, he's, he's a wicked talented guy. Very good. Yes. Um, <laughs> Very good indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I, one of my little like favorite moments just is when during um, No Safe House, when Zero starts waxing poetically about Agatha and the siren goes off and he's like, I'm going to stop you there. Cause the siren's going, but I insist you continue when we're safe. <laughs> like he's so impressed. Uh, yeah. He's like, Oh, the poetry. Yes. We don't read and write poetry. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, this is Ray Fine. Yeah. It's Ray Fine. This is his award. It's, yeah, not not really not really a competition. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many possibilities, but nobody shines like he does in this movie. Uh he's so like he's our guy, you know. You're focused on him the entire time because who he's got this energy about him, this manic dedication. And no one else could have pulled that off, I don't think. Like any he, he's he's just the man. I love Ray Fines. Yeah, and Gustav, one of the best nursing characters. Uh, just just lights out. This is this is great stuff. We've spoken about it a ton on this episode. Should have got a nomination. Should have got more recognition for this particular role. But that's the way the cookie crumbles, and uh, that's why I like to bring stuff like this up on these shows. You know, on Oscar Sundays specifically, is to just kind of bitch and complain about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, with that, let's take it to the Deacons. All right, what you got? Uh, mine is uh, 
the skiing scene that leads into uh, Gustav hanging off the mountain and Joplin, you know, put, kicking the, the ice down and uh, Gustav realizing like, oh, this is the end. And he starts to say a poem and then Zero comes out of nowhere, pushes Joplin off the mountain and Gustav just goes, holy shit, you got him. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect, perfect scene. That whole chase is awesome. And then to finish it off with that, with Willem Dafoe just pounding the ice like like 10 times. And you're like, oh, no, not Gustav. I can't have it happen yet. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. I came close to writing that one down. I came close to writing the uh, what we spoke about earlier in the booth with Serge. Like that whole transaction of words is, is incredible. But I went with... Um, I went with that famous shootout uh, in the hotel after Dimitri sees Agatha running with the painting. The, the famous painting was killed to Gustav, but he sees it as him stealing it. Uh, and then we have people just shooting at him. They don't even know why. Edward Norton's character comes up and he says, who's shooting who? <laughs> and they start yelling about why they're doing what they're doing. And he's like, okay, everyone rest. <laughs> Oh man, that that scene gives me just such a jolt of energy and it makes me laugh so hard. And I, it makes me wonder about Wes's out of four shootouts in movies. Like, what other movies had he seen? It's like, oh, I want to do a shot in movies <laughs> and have guys just fucking bait each other, yelling all kinds of stuff in this crazy hotel. Really awesome. I love that Dimitri pulls out a gun in a hotel loaded with soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just the worst time to do this. Uh yeah, it's great. I love when Zero tries to break the door down to save Agatha and the guy opens the door and he just hurls himself out the window. Me too. It's Me great. Too. It's I like right that. out of some like right out of a Charlie Chaplin movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, beautiful. This uh oh, this film... Charlie Chaplin is an obvious influence. Uh oh yeah. Yeah, Ch- Chaplin's a definite influence uh from time to time, but that's a whole nother hour. true i'm gonna give this film a nine but it is so so close to a 10 uh another viewing will probably push it over the edge yeah yeah that's what happened to me last night i had it as a nine and then i watched it again moved up to a 10 yeah you just when you're giving out awards to a movie and you're watching it with that intent you realize holy hell every scene is spectacular and i have so many options for stuff like the deacons and i have yeah, sure, I have Ray Fiennes as a clear PSH, but like, if there was a second place, I have no idea where I would go. And the, the Ennio was very hard for me to choose, and the Tarantino, all these things make me realize how much I love the movie. And I just, you know, fuck it. It's time to give it a 10. You know, I've seen it so many times now, uh, and it's just a personal favorite. All of his movies are. Uh, he, he I, I give him 10s very, very easily. <laughs> <laughs> I, everything I saw... Bottle Rocket had a seven. Everything else had an eight. Ten and Bombs had a nine. Budapest has a nine. So, not bad. Nice. I like it. Well, you know, you never know what can happen when you do a top five and your mind starts racing and can maybe change. You never know. That's true. That's true. And who knows where the French dispatch <laughs> is going to fit into all this. Yeah, exactly. It could jump in. It could take some spots. You never know. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Uh, so, obviously, next Sunday is halloween uh yeah. what are we doing uh next week yes it literally halloween day next and that's very cool uh to have it land on oscar sunday the uh the podcast that that talks about award winning movies and so you you have a a little group of pure horror films you get to choose from and uh i thought it'd be fun to do a little rosemary's baby you know, have have some fun with the fucking devil <laughs> Have some fun with the fucking devil. That is certainly what yeah. we're going to do next week. Yeah. Uh, Rosemary's Baby. I I watched this one time when we did our Roman Polanski filmgasm focus. And this movie got, it unnerved me so much. It got under my skin. I was so creeped out. I didn't expect that. So I'm super excited to uh, watch this again with the intent of giving it awards and really analyze this thing and try to find out why is this so scary. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what we're going to do. So come on back next week for Halloween. Uh, 
Obviously, tomorrow we're doing French Dispatch for sneak preview. What's on Filmgasm? Oh, Filmgasm this week is very special. Um, our uh, Filmgasm co-host, Josh Allred, is going to be hosting this episode. Um, we're doing a 1980s cult film called Trick or Treat, uh, which sounds absolutely fucking bonkers. Um, he, rec- uh, he selected this as our Halloween week film since we already covered a Michael Myers film a couple weeks ago. Um, so we're going to just leave it up to Josh and see what he brings us. I'm very excited to not have to do much. It's going to be nice. Yeah, no kidding. I'm sure I'm sure you're looking forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be a fun episode. Uh, so yeah, that's the that's the week. Uh, tune in next week on Halloween if you've got time to hear us talk about Roman Polanski once again and the horror classic Rosemary's Baby. Going to be a blast. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, we will see you next week. Thank you.